The following is brought to you by the Social Suplex Podcast Network. This is Hikaleo. I am ELP. And this is Keeping It Strong Style. We love you. Mwah. Yo, this is Rich Ladder from One Nation Radio. This is brought to you by the Social Suplex Podcast Network. We present to you the Ace of Podcasts, Keeping It Strong Style. Let's go. It's the Ace of Podcasts, Keeping It Strong Style. Covering New Japan, they ready to hold it down. Jeremy Donovan and the young boy Josh. Come and hit a job out in Barrio the Frost. From Tokyo Dome over to the G1. Social Suplex is the network where we can get it done. I'm a chill and let them have it because this is just an intro keeping the strong style six stars from the get-go boy yeah from tampa bay to the tokyo dome this is keeping it strong style with your host jeremy donovan and the young boy joshua smith and thank you for listening welcome to keeping it strong style the ace of podcasts on the social suplex podcast network jeremy donovan here with the young boy josh smith on today's show, we'll review the last two nights of the New Japan Soul Tour and cover all its news in the world of New Japan Pro Wrestling. Please support our show by subscribing and following the Social Suplex Podcast Network or keeping a strong style on the podcast app of your choice and leaving a rating and review. You can also get all the network's podcasts over at socialsuplex.com. Check out our Pro Wrestling Tea store, ProWrestlingTees.com slash Social Suplex. That's where you can get your official Keeping It Strong Style t-shirt. If you enjoy this podcast, please consider making a one-time or monthly donation by visiting SocialSuplex.com slash donate and click on the donate button under the Keeping It Strong Style logo. And we are streaming live right now on Patreon.com slash KI Strong Style for IWGP subscribers. If you want access to the weekly live stream, ad-free audio, and bonus content, subscribe at patreon.com slash KI Strong Style. Young boy, how you doing, man? Yeah, I'm doing well. I've noticed that we've uh, gained a few more um, subscribers to the Patreon recently. So, you know, thank you for your patronage and for uh, joining us along our uh, content creation path. And uh, we enjoy doing that for you guys, and uh, we appreciate your support. And uh, yeah, uh, I'm back. Welcome back. I on the show last week. Uh, I do. I I I'm very uh, remorseful that I wasn't able to be on the show last week because we were in a group chat, and uh, Rich, we have our own private one between the four you, me, James, Rich, and uh, the four they pillars. talked about yeah the four pillars, <laughs> the uh, the EVPs, um, but. Essentially, uh, Richard mentioned. Yeah, I muted yourself. I've mentioned this on the show before. I don't know why, but the StreamYard just sometimes like unplugs me. Uh, let me get my correct mic back up. But anyways, uh, while I'm doing that, talking to Rich, he, he mentioned you know that they'd seen uh, Forbidden Door. That should be better. Yeah, and I was like, well, why don't you guys come on Kiss? And I was just joking. And then they're like, oh, all right, we can do that. So we ended up doing a, uh, you know, split show. But uh, even though I was the genesis of why we were doing the show, I couldn't make it. <laughs> it's all good. I would have a qu- uh, comment here from uh, Lee Chang is Bay 2. Says, first and foremost, want to thank Jeremy and the guys from the One Nation Radio for giving me a three hour plus show to listen to you with their Forbidden Door review. I was in the hospital recently for a broken wrist and needed something to kill time. So thank you guys again. My question is, where was YB? Did he pull an Okada and refuse to put people over? Why didn't he come out on the show to job out and bury those frauds? <laughs> well, uh, I, I first off just want to say, hope you're feeling better there. Lee Cheng is Bay. We always appreciate any and all kind words. Um, yeah, I wish I had been on the show. Um, I was just sick. Uh, I don't even know what, exactly what was wrong with me, but for a few days there, I just was feeling right. Uh, I didn't eat, I didn't wrestle last week either. Uh, so it wasn't just skipping out on, <laughs> on AEW talk. Uh, it was, you know, I, I just generally wasn't feeling good. I thought I, I was able for a very brief time. You probably saw Jeremy where I was able to, uh, you know, jump in the chat and see what you guys had going on. And I thought it was uh, pretty cool to see the setup with all three of you guys on the screen at the same time. Uh, we'll see what the setup looks like with four of us or, or more in the future. 
Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I thought you guys did a really great job. I listened to the show. Obviously, it was a, a lot to cover. You guys did awesome. Um, I would have liked to have had a potentially dissenting voice in the <laughs> in the discussion. Um, not that I severely disagreed with you guys, because that's not the case at all. But I do feel like there was a New Japan perspective that could have been explored a little bit more during the episode as opposed to uh just discussing like the the booking and the the results and, and everything like that but you guys did a really did do an awesome job um and i would have liked to have been on that show i just wasn't feeling right it's all good uh, glad you're uh, feeling better here and uh, could be on tonight because we've got lots of uh great stuff to talk about new japan very uh very exciting stuff happening right now in new mm-hmm. japan uh, there's a lot of buzz, got a lot of comments, a lot of discussion about what happened last week with the conclusion of New Japan Soul. Uh, but before yep. we jump into that, we do have to do uh, the June Wrestler of the Month and Match of the Month. Uh, I'd asked you about it last week, but I don't think you saw it being sick. I did friend. see it, and then I figured we'd talk about it before we recorded, and then we didn't record together, so... We didn't talk about it. <laughs> so, but um, on, on air <laughs> production the meeting. First, <laughs> the first thing that you had mentioned was that El Desperado was likely the wrestler of the month. And I, I do agree with that. I mean, between winning the tournament, having the best matches of the tournament in the month of June, plus everything that went along with uh, uh, the Despy Invitational, um, it's pretty undeniable. And then I, he, he won the title in that same month too. So, yeah, El Desperado, Wrestler of the Month for June is like a slam dunk. There's really no other ar- argument worth listening to at, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yeah, Desperado, June, Wrestler of the Month. The, the match of the month is going to be a little bit... Uh, I see you've got Desperado and uh, Ishimori, the best of Super Junior final. Um, and I think that that is the highest rated match on cage match. I'm fine with that. There's, there's a few other ones that were probably worth considering like uh ishimori and tjp doki and el desperado those uh those um semifinal matches were both also of a really high caliber um a lot of people are high on Cobb and Ishii too and i don't i i wasn't sure what your opinion was between all those matches i thought Cobb and ishi was great um i think i gave this the same rating as the desk b Ishimori mm. match, but I, I gave a little bit more weight to Despy and Ishimori since it is it was the tournament finals and then it was higher highly rated compared to I think it had a little bit more higher rating than the Cobb Ishii match. I think Dave was a little bit higher on it as well. So I think across the board it seemed like every like in June it seemed like uh Despy Ishii was the match people really Yeah, that was one where I wasn't totally sure I was gonna kinda defer to you on that one but i'm totally fine with that being the match of the month i think it's probably a deserving winner yeah i mean at, at this point uh despy needs all the, the flowers he can get <laughs> <laughs> that's that's true <laughs> well uh let's jump into new japan soul so we had the second to last night of the tour last week july 3rd from cork and hall Show opened up. We had the Just Five Guys team of Doki, Sonata, and Takamichi Noku, and Yuya Uemura defeating the team of Togi Makabe, Tomioka Hanma, El Desperado, and Yuji Nagata in nine minutes and five seconds. Yeah, I mean, the main story of this match, just a, a fine little opener uh, serving as a, pre, a preview match for uh, Doki versus Desperado for the title the, the next following evening. I did think it was funny to kind of see Desperado just matched up with all the geriatric dads, like by (laughs) default, because, you know, and that's one thing too, probably worth taking a look at, Um, you know, Desperado, he's one of the most popular uh, wrestlers in the company. He's pretty much by default aligned with Hontai, but doesn't have like a clear definitive role, unless you just want to say that he's like the de facto um like top junior like the liger representative for new japan if that's what you see but i've always seen uh desperado as more of like a you know like a rebel to a certain extent and i feel like he probably needs to at some point either be aligned in a faction or maybe even lead a faction potentially based on his star presence um but in the meantime he's they got him teaming with hanma and (laughs) makabe and 
Nagata. And it's a weird fit for him. Yeah, it's really weird seeing him team with those guys. And yeah, it does feel like he's better off as that kind of rebel black hat kind of character, that more Suzuki goon vibe, or even kind of that when he was with strong style uh, with Suzuki and um, who else was in that group? Uh, Narita. It was more mm-hmm. kind of like a shooter, kind of like more grimy kind of group. And yeah, now he's with the, you know, happy go lucky Bay face. We fight for the new Japan brand group and it just yeah it doesn't always it doesn't really quite fit don't get me wrong i mean uh desperado is sort of a jack of all trades he can kind of like uh you know put on different skin and become you know somebody that's <laughs> ethan saber jr says strong style too <laughs> electric boolu um <laughs> you know he's a guy that can do comedy he can do death match stuff he can do shoot stuff so i mean for the time being it's not the worst fit in the world but i feel like given where his career has brought him to he's kind of deserving of a bigger platform than just being like you muted yourself again jeremy stop saying i muted myself i didn't <laughs> mute myself the, the machine is muting me because they don't want the world to hear what i have to say i'm being silenced <laughs> but no um yeah, I just don't. I, I just don't know if like uh, Hontai is the greatest fit for for El Desperado, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's like you mentioned, the main focus of this match was uh, Despi and Doki kind of getting their last uh, preview in for the title match. Uh, Uemura ended up getting the win here over Hanmo with a cross body, so it seems like uh, they are heating Uemura up for G One, and he's in a block where he could pick up um, some a decent amount of wins. So getting the win here, and it seems like they're trying to pick up some momentum for him. So moving on to the next match, we had the LIJ team of Hiromu, Teton, and Tsuji uh, defeating the House of Torture team of Ren Narita, Sho, and Kanemaru by disqualification in 5 minutes and 45 seconds. So it's supposed to be a six-man tag. House of Torture did what House of Torture does. They uh, did DQ stuff and uh, brought the chair in, got the match thrown out. And the following match was another LIJ House of Torture match. So... You had the LIJ team of Bushi, Hiromu, and Shingo, and Naito coming out uh, to even the odds here and to uh, ends up turning it into a 12-man tag. Shingo coming out, you know, saying, I'm back from America, and we want to, uh, you know, take on the House of Torture fair and square here. And so they came out, and things got turned into a 12-man tag. And so the whole LIJ team of Bushi, Hiromu, Shingo, Naito, Teton, and Tsuji end up defeating all the House of Torture in uh, four minutes and 34 seconds. Yes, and I am having technical difficulties over here. Thank you for covering on that, Jeremy. No problem. <laughs> but um, yeah, I thought that this was an interesting way to go. Um, we, we see stuff like this sometimes in New Japan, but I can't recall too many times where like it, it, it was done in this manner where it's a six man and then it evolves into a 12 man tag. Funny thing is I thought that the shorter 12 man tag iteration of the match was much better, a lot more hectic people flying in, flying out. And, uh, you know, was a little bit more enjoyable than the DQ house of torture shenanigans we got in the first five minutes. Yeah. And also it it seems like we're kind of starting to see, you know, Tanahashi's whole thing about punishing like the interference and trying to minimize the house of torture stuff where you have it, all right, they they, they screwed stuff up and they, they end up eating it by it turning into a 12-man tag and them losing. So it, it seems like we are kind of shifting the House of Torture stuff. Like It's kind of being punished or it's kind of, you know, being over overruled, so to speak. And so it seems like that whole Tanahashi thing is coming to fruition. Yeah, I mean, I'm a big fan and proponent of wrestling done with a, a sense of realism and gravity to it in that same way where, you know, at a certain point you're, I, I understand that interference and, and cheating is a staple in professional wrestling. Don't get me wrong, but when it gets to a point where it's like the company is overwrought with it and there's nobody in anywhere that has any authority to exercise any sort of repercussions for guys blatantly cheating. It's where you start crossing that threshold where it's like, it's kind of hard to suspend my disbelief for this. Um, 
So I think there has to be that like fine line, happy medium there. I just hope that this is something that continues to evolve and kind of becomes a, uh, a staple of the company because how many times have we seen a group where they start to implement changes and then very shortly that it's thrown to the wayside and they go right back to, you know, everyday uh, operations, the way, you know, business as usual. So um, hopefully that's not what's happening here, but we're actually seeing real change enacted. Yeah, I mean, we'll talk about other stuff up and down this card uh, in these shows, but it does seem like a lot of what Tanahashi has been saying and planning is um, is coming true. Um, so, and that kind of leads into the G1 qualifiers, the semifinals were on this night. So the first semifinal was from the, the B block side of things. We had Bolton Oleg defeating the president, Hiroshi Tanahashi, in six minutes and 50 seconds. Yeah, this was very, this was a divisive, um, you know, outcome. A lot of different uh, dissent voices out there had uh, conflicting opinions and views on this. Um, And I'm a little bit in the middle of the road because on the hand, I think it was exciting for them to do something that was somewhat unexpected. Uh, You and I, two weeks ago, were on the show pretty much predicting that, uh, Tanahashi was a shoe in uh, to kind of go over Oleg Bolton and, and it didn't pan out that way at the same time, some of the sentiments that we had shared about Oleg Bolton, maybe not being quite totally proficiently ready to be like a main guy in the G one. I think that that was on display here where like the match was fine under seven minutes. Um, but it was, I wouldn't call it, it was far from a squash match. It wasn't like he just completely handled Tanahashi. Tanahashi had his moments. It, it was somewhat competitive. Uh, obviously him getting the win in under seven minutes is a huge statement, but it, it also wasn't like this, um, standout performance where you're like, holy shit, Oleg Bolton is the fucking man. And, uh, right, I heard people right. complaining about, was it, several different things that I think are probably plot like, you know, they're, they're real complaints to be had Uh, one that this didn't necessarily in and of itself get Oleg Bolton over the way that you would hope that a win over Tanahashi in a spot like this would Uh, the crowd didn't seem to react the way that you would hope that they would for something like a passing of the guard type moment. Um, And maybe uh, this is just, you know, maybe that it's too early to call something like that. And it's, uh, you know, we'll look back on it a little bit fonder as time goes on. The other thing too, is, um, I kind of questioned the booking of the, of the, uh, the entirety of the tournament, because I feel like Tanahashi going to the finals and then getting beat by an Oleg Bolton would have made more sense than having all of the, uh, all the same, you know, teammates on the one side of the bracket and then the winner going through to, you know, to face Tai Chi. I feel like that had a little bit less impact. Whereas if this had been the final, it might have been a bigger deal than it was, you know, than it even was here. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I, I think that I know like I, I don't have a problem with Bolton winning, but it's kind of just like the way it happened. Um, you know, sub seven minute match and you know, it, it would have been one thing if it was like, all right, he came out and like from the bell, he just ragdolled Tanahashi, like mm-hmm. bell rang, big lariat, you know, bear hug or suplexing him. Just, you know, kind of like Brock Lesnar, John Cena, like SummerSlam. Right. <laughs> like if he had did that and just like wrecked Tanahashi and beat him in seven minutes, I'd be like, oh, wow. Like they're pushing this guy. He's a dominant force. Like he's going to murder people in the G1. But it was almost kind of like a young lion match, except Tanahashi lost. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And I mean, a part of it is like, okay, you have, let's say you did do that. Right. Because how often has new Japan done things like that? Pretty rarely. I can't think of too many times in, in the history of the company where, you know, somebody came through and just completely, you know, uh, jobbed out a top guy. I mean, we're at that point, you're talking about like Vader Anoki in 1987 sort of stuff. Um, if they had done that, then that would have been such a huge statement that you you have to actually like put the jetpack on Oleg Bolton and then then we're talking about him like being like a main 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 player in the G1 and I'm not 100% convinced that's the way they're going so like 
They want to make him look strong, but they can't make him look too strong because he's probably not ready for that level of push, even though they want to push him. And um, it, it's a tough spot, you know, because uh, on the one hand, how often have New Japan fans complained about stagnation and uh, hesitancy to, to push young guys and new guys and to take chances and to do fun, new, exciting things. And then they start doing it. And there's also the aspect where you look at it and you want to nitpick it because it's not a hundred percent perfect. And so I'm kind of there with you where it's like, I have no problem with him winning. I, I, I do see some issues with it, but I don't think it's, um, I, I do think it's a fresh and exciting direction and it, it could ultimately be the start of something that's really prosperous for them. Yeah. I, I think, you know, your are risking condition when a top guy like a Tanahashi has been on top for so long and a young guy's going to beat him. It usually is kind of a, a bigger stage, a longer match or a kind of a squash match kind of thing. And so mm -hmm. Tanahashi is special. And also like, we want young guys push. So it's great. You know, Tanahashi leading by example, saying he wants young guys in bigger spots. He wants to push young guys, which is great. But again, it's, it's Tanahashi. He, you know, ace of the company, one of the top stars of the company. Like I, th I think, you know, that, that win over him is supposed to kind of mean something and be that next big push and elevation, which in right. a way he is, Bolt, uh, Bolton is getting elevated here. He's going to be in, in G1, but at the same time, it's like, man, I wish that, that, that win over Tanahashi could spend a little bit more special. Yeah. And again, it's, it's, it goes back to what I, I've said and, you know, you break it down in, in two ways. Uh, when, when, a, when a young guy like this is being put in the G1, you ask yourself, like, are they ready in ring to deliver the goods and then are they ready in kayfabe and you always hope that those two things coincide and match one another but they're not always the same level um so it's going to be interesting to see where they tr where they push him because and this was one of the conundrums that you and i brought up when we talked about this uh the the issue of them pushing young guys and putting them in the g1 is because if they go through established names like Tanahashi and Tai Chi and people like that, you can't then turn around and make them be the bottom feeder of the block. If you do, then this entire exercise in uh, doing a mini tournament to qualify is uh, it's really for naught because they've gained singles wins at this point and now they have to be treated. I'm not saying they need to win, but they can't be the young lion bottom feeder who loses every single night. Otherwise you've made the tournament that led to the tournament superfluous and, and it buries all the guys they beat along the way. But I don't feel like they're ready to push these guys to that tip top level just yet. And I don't think that the work in these tournaments has matched where you would, you know, maybe want to fantasy book these types of guys either. So it's a, it's a tough situation a little. Yeah, I, you can't have Bolton go out there and be 0-9. Like, I, that's not going to work. Like, he just beat Tanahashi, and we'll talk about the Tai Chi match, but he, he can't be 0-9. He, he has to get some wins. He, I'm not saying he needs to be go 6-3, and three, but he probably should maybe be 4-5, and 3-6. and six. Like, he right. he should get some points on the board. Um, right. Because, yeah, he's, he's, being a, he's beating the ace. He beat one of the greatest IWGP, you know, world champions ever. And then he can't go in there and then he loses to, you know, whoever, you know? And, and the tough thing with that too, is a lot of Gato's booking oftentimes in the past has revolved around the idea that you have that gimme guy who's going to drop a lot of pinfalls. And when you have a tougher field, like they do now, these two gentlemen, and I guess we're, we're kind of jumping ahead here, but like these two young guys that are going into the G1, Traditionally, they would be that bottom feeder who would go, you know, eight and one, you know, or seven and two, or I'm sorry, two and seven, you know, one and eight, maybe nine and zero and nine. Um, and they can't. If they do, then what was the point of all this? You know what I mean? Right. So it, it's interesting. It's it's going to be interesting to see how how he balances that all out. Are we going to therefore wind up with uh, a lot more parity based blocks because of this? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, Bolton he got the win with the Kamikaze that forward uh, barrel roll maneuver, six minutes fifty seconds. Then we go to the A block side of things. We had the Prince of Pace 
Callum Newman defeating Kenta in 14 minutes and 38 seconds. This was good. Um, not great, but it was a good match. There was good action. Um, Callum Newman, very, very aggressive. And it was sort of like uh, the story of like, you know, the young stud who's full of piss and vinegar, you know, trying to make a name for himself. And then Kenta, the wily veteran who's using all every trick in the book that he has. And, you know, there was ref bumps and kendo sticks and low blows. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, it was it was a pretty, you know, physical contest. But and there was a lot of times where it looked like Kenta was probably going to beat Calum Newman. And I know for me watching it going in unspoiled, seeing Oleg Bolton win made me feel like the potential for Calum Newman to lose was a lot higher. So I was that much more surprised when they decided to put both young guys through, honestly. Yeah, because uh, we had talked about that last week. Like, if probably only one of them will, would go through um, mm-hmm. and instead of both of them. Uh, but yeah, yeah, Ethan Saber here, yeah, talking about the whooping that uh, Newman got. And, like, yeah, I, I would say he, he earned the win here because we, we, Kenta turned back the clock a little bit, went back to uh, pro wrestling Noah Kenta, and, man, he was slapping the crap out of Cal Newman in this match. Not not only the slaps, not only the chops, the drop kick to the face in the corner, uh, those kendo stick shots were fucking hellacious. Yeah, he was treating this man like he is a, a young lion in the dojo, got the, the kendo stick out, was whooping on him there. Um, like you mentioned, Kenta pulled everything out. Uh, he, he went back to the Noah style. He did the 20, 24 Kenta style with the ref bump and uh, the low blow, which I thought that was, oh, that's how he's going to, you know, get through here and stop Callum, but Callum was able to kick out, uh, eventually rallies and uh, hits a jumping knee, followed by springboard double stomp, and then the Oz cutter, one, two, three, and he uh, beats Kenta. Kenta also tried to use the Defy World Championship, and I think if he'd landed that belt shot, you know, just going by wrestling logic, you get hit with the belt. That's that's it. <laughs> when I play when I play wrestling video games, like I love hitting people in the face with, especially like in no mercy because with no mercy you would do the dive and you would like <laughs> fall down to the ground with it. And it was like, that was like a, a KO, like you're winning the, the match type shit. So um, lucky for Calum, he was able to avoid the uh, fucking defy world title. So yeah, I picked up the win here and uh, you know, you had two, two kind of miracle runs going simultaneously on the same night back to back. Yeah. And of course, also the Corgan crowd, they're big and underdog. So they're uh, really rallying behind Bolton and Callum here. So, yeah, interesting way to kick off the semifinals. Uh, then we go back to the B block. We had Tai Chi defeating TJP in 19 minutes and 26 seconds. Yeah, and, you know, obviously the winner of this match goes on to face uh, Oleg Bolton. One thing we didn't really touch too much on was, the, I think, also the shock that this would be the first time since, like, 2001 that Tanahashi just wasn't in the G1. I feel like that was in some ways the main takeaway that a lot of people like it almost overshadowed the excitement of what they were doing with Oleg Bolton. You know what I mean? Because right. people were like, holy shit, Tanahashi's not in. And that that like almost was the bigger, you know, takeaway, which, uh, you know, is a little unfortunate. But, um, you know, at this point, you had to kind of wonder, like, all right, let's say they put TJP through. What does TJP versus Oleg Bolton look like at this point after he just, you know, molly whopped Tanahashi? Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, friend of the show, Chris Samson, he tweeted out last time there was a G1 tournament without Tanahashi. The iPod had not been released. 9 11 hadn't happened yet. The first Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings films were a few months from release. And the first Xbox was a few months from release. I love the first Xbox. Had a lot of great games on that. Um, yeah, uh, but this was good. Uh, I, I liked this even better than the match prior. So very good action here. And, uh, Tai Chi and TJP, they picked up, you know, kind of where they left off and in, in that, um, final match of the, uh, the five on five gauntlet, uh, challenge that they had a couple months back. And ultimately, even though TJP, you know, tried his damnedest to prove that he is El Capitan, he is open weight guy and that he can surmount any challenge place in front of him. He just, he didn't have enough for Tai Chi on this night. Tai Chi, you know, murdering this guy with the kicks and the suplexes and ultimately hits him with the black Mephisto and, uh, you know, sends the bum home one, two, three. 
Yeah, yeah, it was very aggressive here in this match. TJP was fighting from underneath, trying to use the speed, trying to use his you know, submission skills as well. But yeah, Tai Chi, for the majority of the match, was kind of overwhelming him. Uh, there was a spot towards the end where Tai Chi hits the, uh, the common Gary uh, in the clothesline, and uh, TJP kicked out at one, but then, like you mentioned, uh, immediately, super kick, uh, Black Mephisto, one, two, three, pins this man and stares into the camera. <laughs> You know, one thing I don't think TJ, or Tai Chi gets enough credit for is like how awesome his fucking move set is. And like, I'm pretty sure I've had like creative wrestlers that have very similar move sets to modern day Tai Chi. Yeah, Tai Chi's move set is so great. I mean, he's just great in general. Uh, yeah. And speaking of great, that takes us to the main event of this show. We had the last A Block semifinal match Yoshihashi defeating Big Tom, Tomohiro Ishii. In 26 minutes and one second. You know, Jeremy, this might sound like uh, some AEW hater shit. It, but honestly, if we're taking a look at every match from Forbidden Door, putting aside the the matches that occurred between uh, AEW contracted talent, so mainly taking away the main event, which was incredible, by the way, Osprey and, and, uh, and Swerve. But if you if you put this matchup against every single like New Japan contracted uh, you know match from that night, uh, this is the match to beat right now for match of the month. Uh, Yoshihashi and Tomohiro Ishii just fucking ruled. And you know if you haven't seen it, you need to go off your win and check it out. And uh, I kind of you had to figure it was going to be really really good considering these two guys their track record against one another and elsewhere. Um, but, and it was definitely like a pick me, you know, gimme match because both guys had the ability to kind of go through, but I really thought Tomohiro Ishii was going to win here, especially considering the, that they put Callum Newman through. I was like, all right, it, it's for sure going to be Ishii. I don't know if Ishii is going to beat Callum Newman, but he's going to be the final guy that he has to kind of surpass. And like, nah, he, he lost to Yoshiashi here, which was like kind of shocking. And, um, maybe to a lesser degree as shocking as uh Tanahashi but you know obviously Ishii's strat you know his status in the company isn't quite as high and he's also not as tenured as Tanahashi is but considering like you know the history of him in the G1 as as maybe the greatest competitor in the in the tournament's history the fact that both him and Tanahashi both got ousted on the same night like totally shocking shit here and the, and the match was incredible yeah, Ethan Saber says that Ishii and Yoshihashi found out they wouldn't be in the G1 and put their working boots on. Uh, but yeah, this match was just so great. And like you, uh, I thought Ishii was going to win, with especially with Callum Newman going through. Uh, but yeah, these guys, they, they had a G1 match here. I mentioned this mm-hmm. on, on the Donovan Digest on, on the Patreon. Like These two guys went out here and had their G1 match. Like This could have been on any A block, B block night. You know, one semi-main event, uh, third match on, on, on from the five matches, and went out there and just killed it. Super hard hitting match, tons of chops, tons of close lines. Uh, both guys were really fired up, and yeah, ended up being Yoshihashi hitting the Karma one two three. And I think it's another big deal because Yoshihashi had never beaten Ishii in a singles match. I think the, he was like zero and four against Ishii, so finally beating Ishii and uh, bouncing him out of this tournament. Yeah, and that's one of those things in New Japan. Oftentimes, when you're when you're watching other companies and you see that guys go, you know, one and one, two and one, three or whatever, like you kind of figure that they're gonna go 50-50 as much as possible, oftentimes to just kind of keep everything equal. New Japan doesn't always operate that way. It's very common where somebody will go, you know, three and oh, four and oh, five and oh. But once you start getting to like that four to five and they've never lost to the person that's where you start thinking like they might like pull the upset here if like everything is right and you know it was a perfect storm of of uh everything that was needed for that to kind of be facilitated here and it did happen and uh yoshihashi beats tomohiro ishii um i guess that's a great way to sort of make yoshihashi look strong given the fact that on the next night (laughs) He wasn't going to qualify <laughs> for the fucking tournament. Um, if I had the book, I, you know, it's probably not a surprise to anybody, but I, I would have put Ishii through. Um, you know, there's been a lot of scuttlebutt about the idea that Ishii 
can't do a G1 because his body can't hold up. But then lo and behold, he's out of the tournament and he's working Rep Pro. He's working AEW. He's got dates internationally like lined up. Like this man's uh, like basically taking a page out of Minoru Suzuki's book and figured out how to like get himself over overseas. And he, but the difference is, is like his version, like, you know how Minoru Suzuki has his, his match. And once you've seen it, you're like, Oh, it's just Minoru Suzuki match. Mm-hmm. Ishii is the same way, except his match is the Ishii match. And it always fucking rules. And you're like, damn, like, why can't he be doing this in the G1? I don't understand. He's going to work the same amount of dates overseas anyways. <laughs> I know everybody's like, oh, uh, we're hearing that uh, his body's just so broken down. He can't handle a G1. And then this week on Dynamite, four-way match with Claudio, Kyle Fletcher, and Pac. Oh, he's he's going to Rev Pro to face, uh, I forgot who he's, he's facing in Rev Pro. It's like, yeah, he's, he's making all these international dates. And I get it. Maybe it's not a, a back-to-back uh, G1, but there's, there's travel. He's wrestling top guys in big matches. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a that's a little sus. I don't know. But um putting all that aside, this match was incredible. Huge kickouts, in, in big moves, like everything that you would expect from Ishii and Yoshihashi and um you know, again, I I get, it's it's not a surprise to anybody. Neither of these two gentlemen made it into the G1. Both of them have been staples of the G1 for many years now and have been well, you know, in, in the case of Ishii, he's always like a top two, top three performer in the overall landscape of the tournament. But Yoshihashi's always like that dark horse, kind of unheralded, great performer. Um, but neither guy in recent times in the kayfabe has had a lot of meaningful wins or has done significantly well in the tournament. So there's kind of like this trade off where it's like you want to see both of them in the tournament because you know that they're going to put on spectacular matches but they also kind of don't matter because they, they they don't stand a chance of actually winning or going far or deep in the tournament anyways so it's sort of like it's it's a tough call in that respect because you know the purists like the the work rate you know freaks we want to see these guys go but you also know that they don't stand a chance of winning the tournament and so at some point I guess this was sort of the trade-off in order for us to not have to sit through, you know, uh, who are all the guys that were in this tournament that, that we were glad got eliminated. Yujiro and Chase Owens. Right. Like all those guys like Chase Owens, Yano, Ujiro, Yano and the, you know, there's a bunch of others. The list goes on and on. There was a whole bunch of people in this tournament who got cut. We kind of had to also sacrifice Yoshihashi and Ishii in, in the process, which was unfortunate and maybe not, Oh, and and you know we'll get to it but tai chi too it's not ideal but it, it, that is the situation we find ourselves in where it's like by doing this play in tournament certain guys that that have mattered from a fan perspective just aren't going to be in it yeah and i like the fact that on commentary chris charlton was really kind of hammering home the fact like these guys have had losing records in their last few g1s i think yoshihashi's like never had a winning i think he's always been like four and five or below um, his G1 so it's like from a K- kayfabe aspect it's like yeah they might be great wrestlers but when it comes to results in G1 like they're not getting winning records so yeah why are they in there and so it made sense for these guys to be fighting for their G1 spots and yeah Yoshihashi gets the win uh there was a crazy crucifix bomb towards the end where Yoshihashi didn't even get the, the full thing to get the pinfall version of it but just like drilled Ishii on his neck and yeah, and led into the karma one, two, three. Yoshihashi gets the win. Yeah, I mean, we we haven't done even enough justice. We're, we're singing the praises of the match, but you know, we unless we went, you know, play by play, blow for blow, and gave you the whole rundown, it's not going to do justice. If if you are listening and you have not seen Ishii versus Yoshihashi, uh, this is a highly recommended match. You need to see it. It was fucking awesome. Yeah, I definitely recommend for folks go out of your way. Buy this match. I mean, it's G1 season. If you had not subscribed to New Japan World, now's a good time to subscribe. Uh, watch this match. After you subscribe to our Patreon, then you, know, right. then you can subscribe. Because you don't need to be subscribed to New Japan World. Because if you pay us the money, we'll watch it for you and then tell you what happened. <laughs> <laughs> but then if you want to, as a supplement to this podcast, you can... 
throw down 9.99 yen and that will be the supplement to keeping it strong style that's new japan world you can watch what we've <laughs> talked about and see if we were accurate or not yeah <laughs> Well, uh, that's going to take us to the final night of New Japan Seoul, Friday, July 5th from the Tokyo Budokan. She opened up. We had TMDK, Kosei Fujita, and Zack Sabre Jr. defeating the Bullet Club team of Gato and Kenta in 6 minutes and 20 seconds. Fine opener. I don't have really much more to say than that. Just, you know, fine little opener. Yeah. I, I, I miss I miss the... Uh, the the fucking lions. I wish we could have got those guys again, but uh, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, the the two new uh, young lions. Yeah, not the not the the two new new ones, not the other new ones. <laughs> I you don't even bring those guys out, but bring out the new new ones. Uh, so yeah, Vegeta got the win over here on uh, Gato. So it seems like they're giving Vegeta and Zach some wins. Uh, Zach a heavy favorite to win new uh, win G one. So. Getting him on the winning side of things, and then Kosei Fujita again pushing the young guys here, uh, beating the Booker. <laughs> so <laughs> good stuff there for those guys. Then we had the United Empire team of Francesco Akira, Great Okan, and TJP defeating the Just Five Guys team of Sonata, Takamichi Noku, and Yuya Uemura in nine minutes and eighteen seconds. Yeah, so the United Empire team picked up a win here post-match. We got some jaw-jacking and back and forth between TJP and Sonata. Uh, and part of me was wondering, like, I don't know, is that is that a feud that I'm, like, rearing to see necessarily? I don't know. <laughs> and, it, are, and are these the two leaders of these factions? And if so, like... Do we need just five guys in, in United Empire at this point? Like, here's a here's a funny thing. I don't know if you saw this, Jeremy, but I saw comments from Great O'Con where he's like, "Yeah, we're thinking about wrapping up uh, United Empire. There's really no need for all of us to kind of do this anymore." And then, you know, fucking uh, TJP's like, "Yeah, we're in full force. Everybody is more aligned than we ever have. In fact, we're adding people." <laughs> yeah. I was like, what's, "What's going on in this fucking group?" Yeah, Ocon sees the writing on the wall. He's like, man, we got TJ. We went from Will Ospreay to TJP. Time to, jo- time to join Hontai. <laughs> time for me to be uh, Oka again. <laughs> oh, man. So, yeah, uh, they get the win there. A lot of focus on Ocon and Uemura. They just had that KOPW rivalry. Um, and I think they're in the same block as well in G1. So, Kind of continuing their feud. One thing uh, that you mentioned last or uh, on the night prior that I didn't get to comment on was um, you and more hitting cross bodies for the wins. Are we still it's where we're still at? You know, we're still doing the Ricky, the Dragon Simo cosplay shit. Like, yeah. are we going to evolve, move beyond this? Like, you know me, I'm a purist. I I love classic wrestling. They, don't get me wrong, but you know you got to come up with your own identity you can't just be the guy that just goes out there and hits crossbodies like that's what you do yeah <laughs> not gonna win a g1 that way uh ethan saber says speaking of adding people do you think Takeshita will join united empire if Takeshita joins united empire i hope he super kicks uh tjp on the way out the same way that like uh Shawn Michael is super kick Bra- or uh, Booker T in the NWO. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like one of these dudes is not like the rest of us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Also, by the way, did you? Uh, oh, go ahead. No, so Ethan said that they're kind of stacked, but given the undercard tags, having him working with the group, it may be possible. Uh, we'll see. There's a, you know, who knows? I don't know. I, is he part of Don Callis' family? Is he a DDT guy? Does he have a contract with AW? I don't know. I don't know what the status is there. Um, did you watch any of the NXT show last night? No. Bro, it was fucking good. I know. Apparently, it's like the best WWE pay-per-view of all time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I forget, yeah. I didn't, I didn't finish it because, um, uh, you know, uh, full disclosure, I'm I'm a big fan of House of the Dragon, H O T D, Hot D. You know I love Hot D. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I didn't I didn't watch the whole show. But like, here's how I knew it was going good. Rich Latta was singing the praises of the show. 
Rich will find any reason to bury WWE, period. He fucking hates everything that's, you know, even partially like aligned with with WWE. And he was like, yeah, this show's on pace. And I was like, oh, shit, I better turn. You know what what they did? They were like, (laughs) let's do some flips. That's how we'll get Rich to watch. Let's send a bunch of flippy dudes, flippy guys and girls out there. (laughs) Bro, it was good. Like, I didn't finish the whole show. I just watched the first three matches. But, like, everything I saw was really good. And, um. And I'm always hesitant, to, bro. Most any like NXT show I've turned into for for years now has been shit. Like nothing close to like what a takeover was. But this was pretty fucking good. Um, but Booker, the reason I brought it up, Booker T, atrocious. Just the <laughs> god awful worst fucking commentator that has ever lived. Oh man, bro. He made he, like literally like uh, we were watching the show. Uh, my girlfriend she was like yeah i'm like literally like just completely tuning out everything booker t says right now because this is got he's god awful he's <laughs> horrible uh, this makes me think about uh him doing uh commentary and tna as black snow <laughs> bro i didn't really watch tna at that point so like i've heard people make the jokes about it but i don't really i don't know what black snow was <laughs> oh so uh, going on with this card here, uh, we had uh, House of Torture, Evil, Narita, Sho, Kanemaru, and Yujiro defeating Tanahashi, Taguchi, Tiger Mask, Hanma, and Yuji Nagata, 11 minutes, 31 seconds. And this was Taguchi's uh, comeback match from the uh, bike accident that he had right before Best of Super Juniors. I like the way you said, uh, getting back to this card here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I'm glad, uh, you know, Taguchi, he lost old, an old Puro staple. You know, you've, you've had some time off. You got to do the job. They're telling a story. They're letting us know that, like, as good as Taguchi once was, he's he was in a bike accident. He's not ready. He's, he needs to work his way back up the ranks and find his old fighting form. Um, no, I'm just playing. That's not what they were doing. <laughs> they, they just took losses here because these are a bunch of old dudes. Like, I don't know what the median age is between Tanahashi, Taguchi, Tiger Mask, Kanma, and Nagata, but you got to imagine it's somewhere in the like 50 ish range. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but House of Torture, they did exactly what you would expect with House of Torture. And we wound up with a fucking, you know, steel enforced push up bar s- smash. And then, uh, you know, everything is evil. And for the one, two, three. Yeah, Togo distracted the ref. Yeah, Narita hit Hanma with the push-up bar. Everything is evil on Hanma. One, two, three. They get the win, and that was it for the undercard there. TJP comes out on commentary, and we go into the finals of the qualifier tournament. Uh, so first... What about uh, the what about the um, LIJ six-man? Uh, that was after the qualifiers. Oh! That was uh. a semi-man. For some reason, I thought that happened before these. Uh, so first we had that's the... Happens, that's what happens when you have New Japan World and you can't watch the fucking show in just in a, in a steady succession. You have to click into each and every single fucking box. That's what happened. Like, for some reason, like, my thing moved and I clicked on that one incorrectly. And so I ended up watching that before these ones. And I missed the old days where you could just hit one file and just watch the show. So I've noticed if I watch it on my laptop, it will, if I click from the beginning, it will automatically autoplay the next video. But if Yeah, I, but I don't want that. <laughs> I don't want it to just autoplay. I just want one file that just seamlessly plays the whole, why can't I just watch the show, dude? Yeah. The really annoying thing is like, if you try to watch it like while it's still live and like only like some of the matches are up and you have to like wait until the whole show is done to that upload yeah. all the pieces, I'm like... Yep. Yeah, and that sucks too. There's there's so many and I feel like we are one of the shows uh you know, amongst all the other podcasts that are out there, we go the least hard on New Japan for how shitty New Japan World is because there's people complaining all the time about this shit. Yeah. Um so we had the the, a, the final in the A block qualifier, Callum Newman defeating Yoshihashi in 11 minutes and 59 seconds. Pretty good match. Um, you know, Ethan Saber Jr., he's he's here live. He's in the chat and he brought up, you know, Ishii and Yoshihashi. They found out that they wouldn't be in the G1, so they put their working boots on. I feel like 
Taichi and Yoshihashi found out they weren't going to be in the G1 on this night and didn't necessarily put on <laughs> their working <laughs> but, you know they they, they 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 like they worked just hard enough to like plausibly be able to say like yeah we put those kids over but like they didn't go out of their way to like make those kids you know what I mean like they these were not like classic classic matches or anything like that yeah and, and maybe that wasn't the, the instructions, but uh, they were both good matches here. I thought Callum looked really good um, in this matchup, uh, but Yoshihashi was kind of had control majority of the match, came down towards the end where uh, Yoshihashi was going for the karma. Newman flipped out with a stun dog millionaire and got a, uh, a flash roll-up on Yoshihashi. It did kind of look like he, he might have got his shoulder up like right at three, uh, but the ref... Callum three, Callum Newman got the win. Yoshihashi tried to argue it a little bit, but then eventually um, shook Callum Newman's hand, and Callum Newman is officially in the A block. Yeah, um, both of these matches were, uh, you know, essentially babyface, babyface affairs, and so in both cases, you you did get the show of respect and kind of the semi passing of the guard between you know these guys, and this was the first one, and uh, yeah. Uh, I liked the finish. I thought Cal Newman beat him, you know, like you mentioned, fairly clean, but it was a little bit of a a, a shock surprise upset win there. Um, Ethan Sabre Jr. says, do you think Callum will have a Dragon Dia-esque run and get some upset on the last night, this G1, or do you think he'll perform better? And that I don't know, Ethan, if you were in the chat earlier. We, we talked about this where we were saying that given the fact that they have put both of these young guys through and – given them meaningful wins over established talent, they can't put them in the tournament and have them be booked like Dragon Daya was in the Super Juniors. If they do, it's booking malpractice. It's bad booking at that point because not only are you making those guys like cannon fodder, but everybody they beat in the tournament is now devalued in the process as well, just by you know process of elimination. Yeah, I mean, Calum, what he just beats, um, you know, former... Uh, IWGP Tag Team Champion. He's defeated a former Never Open Weight Champion. He's defeated, you know, guys that have been in G1s that go four and five, five and four. You know, Kanto did pretty good in his first G1. Like, he's being like established members of the roster. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, to go into, and I, I know he's in the murderer's row. He has Shingo and Naito and Saber. And so I don't really expect him to beat those guys. But no. Um, I mean, he, he can beat a Gabe kid. Uh, he can be who else is in that a block um bro he could easily easily be somebody that beats one of those guys that you're talking about and that be his big meaningful win i'm not saying that he would beat all those guys but i think he should beat one of those guys and then be like the difference maker when it comes to the math and kind of just uh you know being playing spoiler to some extent yeah, and also there is the whole story with him and Naito, where it's, I mean, you could have him pull um, an upset uh, over Naito. Um, some somewhere in the block, I'm not sure where that match plays out. And we're going to do a big full uh, G1 breakdown and preview and stuff next week on the show with Chris Samsa. So he'll be on the show, and we'll go through some of those key matches, give our predictions, and talk about some of those dates. But yeah, you look at that A block. Um, yeah, he should get an, an upset over one of those top three guys of Naito, Shingo, Saber. But you know, he he can beat a great Okan. He could beat a Gabe Kid. He could beat Evil. He could beat Jake Lee. There there are plenty of uh, guys here in this in this block here where he could at least end up like three and six, if not four and five. Like I could see him if they really want to going four and five and it being believable. Right. Uh, and I agree with you. I think it's plausible that he could beat those guys that you just mentioned. But at the same time, what I'm saying is that he shouldn't and neither should Oleg Bolton just beat the guys that are obtainably beatable and then lose to all the stars. They should still lose some matches to those guys that are senior above them, but they should beat a star. You know, one of them should be a Shingo or something like that. One of them should be, uh, I don't know if I'd say Naito necessarily, but like, <laughs> you know, a Zack Sabre or, or something like a huge upset. Like, and that's the kind of thing that, that we see in the G1 where it's uh, very exciting when like a lower level guy unexpectedly beats an upper level guy. And it maybe doesn't, you know, translate to them being booked uh, higher than them. But for that one night, 
it's it's the difference maker from a mathematical standpoint. We've seen guys beat Tanahashi in the past when when that still meant something, you know. Right, and if they're going to quote unquote fill this, you know, Yano Yujiro role, quote unquote, like you know, Yano would beat every Yano's beat beat Kenny Omega. You can go through and look at the people who Yano Yano was beating. You can look That's at people, exactly what I'm talking about. Exactly, you know, that. Chase Owens beat Tanahashi when he was U.S. champ. So we we've seen lower card guys get wins over main event guys and so yeah i think you know in the a block you know why not have callum get the win back on naito or do a banana peel win over zach saber jr like those are guys that i think it would help or evil. yeah i think evil's a guy i think he could definitely be evil um yeah that'd be tight <laughs> uh, so yeah so Guess the upset win over uh, Yoshihashi here locks his place into the A block. And then in the B block qualifier final round match, we had Bolton Oleg defeating Tai Chi in 16 minutes and 27 seconds. Ethan Saber Jr. says no big huge versus Sonata. Families will starve. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Uh, Yeah, man. Oleg Bolton beats Tai Chi. Uh, I felt like this was probably the best Oleg Bolton outing uh for his run through this uh you know um qualifying tournament um i think i liked the match with him and tai chi a little bit more than the yoshihashi match they were given a little bit more time uh my favorite part of the match honestly was where it seemed like callum new or like oleg bolton was getting ready to go for another kamikaze and then he hit the fucking f5 and then hit a kamikaze for the one two three which was pretty awesome yeah, I, I really enjoyed this matchup. I think this is probably like the most we've seen from Bolton. You know, it's a longer match with an established guy. And uh, yeah, Tai Chi was in control uh, a lot of the matchup, and Bolton would try to outpower him at times. And then uh, he did end up hitting one kamikaze and really landed hard on Tai Chi. And Tai Chi did an excellent job selling it like his ribs were broken. So he was selling uh, the ribs in midsection. From that point on, um, but still, even with that injury, he seemed to be like in firm control at, towards the end, like he was going to win. Uh, and then, like you mentioned, yeah, Bolton was able to reverse uh, Black Mephisto, got him up, hits the F five, or I, sh- I should say the, the final verdict, um, and <laughs> <laughs> uh, then hits another Kamikaze. If you know, you know. Yeah, <laughs> hits uh, another Kamikaze. One, two, three. He beats Tai Chi. Yeah, uh, and I wasn't necessarily, I I wouldn't say I was totally, totally surprised by this because the really the shocking thing for me was him beating Tanahashi. Once he beat Tanahashi, I felt like beating Taichi was, uh, you know, in a kayfabe sense, less of an accomplishment um, and more attainable because he already beat Tanahashi. So the the idea that he could potentially beat Taichi was, was right there for the taking. Um, Ethan, pa- Ethan Saber Jr. says, out of all the potential candidates that have come out of this tournament, I think Tai Chi would have been the only one to qualify in the G1 and make it to the quarterfinals. Yeah, um, I mean, Tai Chi was a guy we were saying, like, he was probably going to be the one guy to go through because he was doing the whole, like, stare at the camera thing. And we yeah. thought only one of the young guys would have gotten in. Um, we, we mentioned it, too. Like, if you mentioned if Bolton was beating Tanahashi, then he might as well just beat Tai Chi because then it, yeah, it, it diminishes beating the ace. Yeah, at that point, if he's going to beat uh, Tanahashi, there's no reason for him to lose to Taichi. Um, so that kind of changed things for me. At the same time, you just never know with uh, New Japan's booking recent times. They're, they've done some kind of surprising stuff as evidenced by this this evening in general. So, uh, you know, it is what it is. Um, Taichi, I, I got to tell you, man, my work ever since I became a financial advisor, like full-fledged, uh, my work has just been crazy. It's made it that much harder to uh, to stay on top of what's going on with New Japan. So, you know, I'm not watching the backstage comments as much or like tuning into like the uh, the wrestling diaries and and shit like that. But I've I've caught a little bit of inkling that like some people thought Tai Chi was potentially going to lose here because I guess he's been making comments about like sumo and like their culture and like you can get. Uh, relegated down into like a lower status the same way that like in, in uh, soccer or, or you know in football that can happen as well like reg- relegation takes place and so I guess like him and 
Tanahashi. I don't know exactly the full scope of it because I don't know if this is taking place like online or if it's uh, in the backstage comments or just on commentary, but like they've been having some discussion about them needing to work their way back up because of every, the ongoings, them being in this tournament and everything like that. And kind of, uh, you know, uh, I guess comparing it to like the sumo culture, sumo world. And the, and we all know how much Tai Chi loves sumo. So um, there are probably some people out there that weren't as caught off guard by Tai Chi losing here based on some of that stuff that was going on. Yeah, I didn't see any of that stuff. The only thing I've been seeing from him is just, kind of the kayfabe comments of complaining about having to be in G1 play in and kind of why it's happening. But I could understand that from a CMO standpoint. Yeah. Soccer um, kind of thing. Yeah. You get the relegation and then you have to kind of build yourself up in that season to then get the shot to get back into whatever tournament world cup or whatever in, in sumo. Um, so, I learned about that from uh, Ted Lasso. Yeah, I was supposed to say, yeah, Ted Lasso, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Without Ted Lasso, I really wouldn't know much about soccer. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so uh, Bolton gets the win here, and we had uh, a lot of questions here about uh, this match, the qualifiers, and uh, everything what happened here. So, first from Def Triangle 720, he says, were you both surprised that both Callum and Bolton qualified? Uh, yeah, a, a little bit. Kind of like we mentioned, we figured that one of the young guys would have gotten through, not both of them. Um, and so I, I was thinking probably more initially. I was thinking you would you would go Callum over Bolton, but then Bolton beating Tanahashi, it's like well, maybe they'd go with him over Callum. But yeah, they went with both of them. Yeah, I mean, you know, as I try to get my dog situated, is it storming where you're at, Jeremy? Uh, it, it was raining for a little bit, but it's it's stopped now. Yeah, for you guys that don't know, we're in Florida, and uh, lately it's been like f- most of the season, it's just been dry and hot, and it's still hot as fuck. I mean, it's probably hot wherever you guys are too. This uh, global warming is crazy. I don't even know if I believe in global warming, but like <laughs> I probably do now because of this shit. Um, but it's been raining like crazy. Luckily, we've needed it for a while, but my dog hates the storm so (laughs) therefore he has to sit on my lap and be comforted uh throughout the rest of the show um i i don't know i'm sure there were probably some people out there that were you know dead set on the idea that both of these guys were going through but i I, i'd like to meet that person because i didn't see it coming this way i don't think that uh we did uh, this is one of those things we didn't we weren't even close to predicting this i think we probably thought it was plausible that one or the other but not both because of you know just the the sheer amount of names of guys that have been staples of the g1 in the past and at the same time like yeah there's been talk about both of these guys being in the G1 all year but when this play in tournament situation came to the forefront it was like damn how it's going to be tough to see both of them go through and they did it. And like you said, Jeremy, this is kind of right in line with some of the stuff that, you know, president Tanahashi uh, had said in his uh, manifesto is top 10 points and pushing young guys and, and, you know, um, giving them new fresh opportunities and stuff like that. Like that's part of that initiative, but uh, I'm as shocked as anybody really. Yeah. Very, uh, well, like I said, the diamond die is bold and ballsy uh, moves here by New Japan. Uh, Death Triangle's other question, do you think the shame New Japan didn't think of doing the qualifier format sooner? I don't know. I mean, I don't want to really analyze. I'm going to give you the John Cena answer. I don't really want to talk about what's happened in the past. Let's, uh, let's only look to the future. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's kind of hard to, I mean, I feel like the G1 format was kind of working the way it was, two-man block and then how they were picking it. Uh, but yeah, also in the, the current climate, things need to change and now was the right time for this. Enough is enough. It's time for a change. <laughs> uh, Let's Commission 7252 says, I love that Newman and, and Oleg are getting a chance to show what they can bring in the G1 but I would be disappointed if they end up only having seven, eight minutes each mat, each match just to only be pin eaters. 
These two show what potential they have for New Japan for the near future. I would like to see both men score at least four or six points in the tournament. Okay, I do agree with you there, and and you're echoing a lot of the same points that we've made. But here's where I I defer. I I and it kind of aligns, but not that much. I care less about how many points they get in the tournament, and I care much more about how many stars they get in the tournament. Procure <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, those stars. If they're not procuring the stars, like if at the end of the day they're they are getting their their obligatory four to six you know points, but they're averaging sub three stars, then then what's the point? You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> and this is the kind of discourse that you and I are probably going to have out of all the New Japan podcasts that are out there and and discussing, and they're going to talk about the the story beats and the progression and you know yada yada. Fuck all that noise. Where's the great matches? <laughs> where where the stars at? Where where the four point seven five at? <laughs> and 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 here's and here's my point with that. If if Tomohiro Ishii was in this tournament, you know that the average star up, that the average amount of stars in this tournament goes up exponentially. If Yoshihashi or Taichi are in this tournament, same thing. I don't know about Tanahashi given his state, but they have to at least, you know that Tanahashi would at least be averaging three and a quarter, three and a half stars. If these guys aren't hitting above the three and a half star threshold, then I don't really care to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> Cause I'm, I'm all about pushing young guys, but I'm not, I'm not in the, the camp where I'm like, let's push young guys just to push young guys because they're young and we just need to have the, the optics of pushing young guys. No, we need to push young guys because young guys have the ability and the threshold to put on the, the, the bangers and the great matches. And if they're not giving me great matches and they're not putting on the bangers and they're not procuring the stars, what is the fucking point? Because <laughs> this company is not going to get back to where it was and where it needs to be just off of, you know, fucking storyline beats and, and, you know, people looking in the camera and, and backstage comments. no, this is a company that's built off of great fucking work. We better see great work from these guys. Otherwise, it was a missed opportunity and not putting in Yoshihashi. And what, what would be the difference between putting these guys in now and Yoshihashi if they're not able to perform at the level that Yoshihashi did? Yeah, I guess it's just, you know, his whole thing of, you know, Throw them out there, get young guys in, in big spots to, to gain experience, which I get that. Um, but yeah, I I feel like both things need to happen. Like they need to get points and they need to have great matches. They, but they also need to be given the opportunity to have great matches. And like uh, Les Commission was saying here, like they can't just get like a seven, eight minute match. Like they should yep. get, especially on just a normal five block match night, they need to get 15, 20 minutes and show what they can do. No, don't get me wrong. I, I agree with you. And I, that's why I said that our points are probably in line with one another because you can't have, a, a, you know, a, a standout tournament in terms of performance when you're relegated to first or second opening match of the night and you only get sub 10 minutes every night. That That's not going to be then, then there's no blame on them. That's just going to be they weren't given the right opportunities. But it's if they if they're given main events or sub main events or if they're put in there with you know, like a Shingo or like a Takeshita or, you know, what have you, one of those top performers, and then they shit the bed. That's where we're going to start looking because if, if, if it's this tough to get in the G1, you got to win a play in tournament to get in the G1. You, it's, it's like that Eminem song, you know, you know, you only got one shot. <laughs> yeah. Know? Uh, I think uh, Callum might be set up a little bit better to, Potentially have more great matches again. He's in there with uh, Zach, Shingo, Naito. Well, uh, he's better too. So there's that, that. That too, yeah. He's more experienced. Um, he, he might have the quote unquote better selection of opponents there. So yeah, he's at a prime spot to uh, really show out and have some great matches. Uh, Bolton, we saw here with this longer Tai Chi match, it, it was pretty good. And so I think uh, being in there, you know, he's going to have guys like Cobb. He can have a hard hitting uh, power match in that B block. He's going to have Suji. In that B block, so there's going to be some guys there, Fantasmo, that I think that could guide him to a good match. I don't know if he's going to be, you know, throwing out four star, four point five stars every night, but he will be in there with guys that can at least 
get him, I think, to a three and a half every night. Ethan Saber says, Oleg versus Sonari about to be fire. I can smell it. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. Listen, it's, it's not that hard. Just go out there and be fucking awesome, you know? <laughs> uh, let's see. Next question here from uh, Death Triangle 720. Do you think Bolton should go the Brock Lesnar style in ring or the Walter style? I could see Bolton using the F5 and power bombs as its main finishers. I don't know. Just go out there and be awesome. Be fucking awesome. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, I would. Why not do a combo of both those guys? Uh, do do the, do the Walter style chops. Do the, do the Brock suplexes. Like combine like the best elements of those guys. Just be awesome. Just go out there and fuck people up. Like, <laughs> get over. You know. Uh, next question from uh, Reddit user Vert underscore McPolygon. What's next for Tai Chi? He did a sterling job in the G One playing tournament. And had plenty of fans behind him. How will New Japan use the sympathy he's built and the mysterious staring at the camera to take him to the next level without the G1? Or is he destined to keep moving downwards? Yeah, that that's a very good question. And I hate to be the guy that um, is wrong here because there there is that possibility. Um, like, remember the year where Suzuki wasn't in the G1 and then he used the fact that he wasn't in the G1 as the catalyst for him getting the Royal Quest shot against Okada. Yeah. Um is there a possibility that there's an ongoing story with Taichi and maybe his exclusion from the tournament is the thing that's going to propel him to something in the future, whatever that might be? We've seen something like that in the past where like there were certain years early on where he was uh, campaigning to be in the G1 before he was a staple and he wasn't getting in. And that was opening the doors for him to have heavyweight single storylines because he wasn't getting included until finally he was, you know, ultimately like a staple of the tournament at the same time. Maybe they don't see Tai Chi the way that the fans do. Like maybe they don't care that there is this contingent, rabid fan base behind him and they and he is getting older and maybe the storyline that we're seeing with him looking at the at the camera is just like part of his you know downward movement in in the hierarchy of the company yeah and we had a similar question from rambo and says uh, what do you think's next for tai chi he seems to have a lot of storyline directions he can go in and he can obviously still work at a high level but he hasn't been featured much at all for a pretty long time and now he's out the g1 and yeah maybe they're gonna do the whole relegation storyline it's like all right just because you were in the g1 this year doesn't mean you're in it next year and you have to fight if you have a losing record you have to fight for it and so i think this could be a whole year story of where taichi has to build himself back up he's in the qualifiers next year and then he wins his you know block qualifier and he gets back in Mm -hmm. that's possible um but I mean, do you think that there will be an immediate storyline that plays out of this? Or do you think we're going to have to wait that full year for him to like try and redeem himself? Yeah, it's, it's hard to tell. Um, Cause I, I don't, again, I don't know how much of it is like the like booking coming from at like, the office versus like what he's doing with his character. And yeah, it's, it's just him doing shit to get himself over. <laughs> right. People talk about him. Or like what his what even his contract status is like because I know at one point he was kind of one of those freelancer guys that where even though New Japan was his main home he didn't have a full time contract so who who knows what the whole full status with him is but I mean it could be a cool story if they do a whole year thing but I could easily see this being like he's just out and we're moving on to the next guys I could see that too I'm I'm hoping the latter i'm hoping that it's something where uh or maybe the former i don't know which one i don't know if it's the former or the latter i i don't know how to use that shit correctly um i'm hoping that this leads to some sort of storyline even if it's not like a world title challenge but if he like gets back in the mix where he's challenging david finley or something like that you know what i mean like Mm -hmm. he's getting back into that upper level that would be cool um but I, I I don't know if I have confidence that that's where we're going. Of course, if if it does turn around and that's where he ends up, I'm going to point back to this moment and say that I predicted it with uh, 100% <laughs> accuracy. So, <laughs> uh, 
uh, <laughs> Doc on Discord says, does Bolton Oleg need new attire? I think he has skipped the young lion trope of graduating the knee pads. He has some support on his left knee. I personally think the black trunks and black boots works on him, like how Kensuke went to the simple look for his top guy run. Yeah, it's a different time, but I don't necessarily disagree. Um, you know, I'm in a few different like New Japan circle. New Japan fans are so weird. Like <laughs> the different kinds of fucking New Japan fans that exist out there. There's so, there's a lot of different circles, but th- this is causing confusion and like malcontent amongst certain fan bases where they're like they said he was graduated but he's not graduated but they were pushing the storyline before but now they're not you know there's like a lot of people that don't know what the fuck's going on and i think part of it is like you've created these tropes in the past where it's like the black attire is a young lion and then when you leave, you you don't wear that anymore. You go on excursion, and now they're starting to buck that trend, and people don't know what what the status of a guy like him is because he's won titles, he's declared himself, but he's still running out to the ring. And I don't know, it might it might it, it doesn't bother me personally, but for other New Japan fans that are like conditioned, maybe they should change things. <laughs> maybe. I don't know. Give him like some fucking spikes on his attire, like add a add a color accent, so people can just stop complaining about him. You know, not being a, a young lion or whatever the fuck. Give him uh, white boots. Yeah, something, something where they're like, oh, see, now he's not a young lion anymore. Yeah, I mean, for me, he, he's still coming out to the young lion mu- music. Like you mentioned, he's still running to the ring, even after the, these wins. He's grabbing the ice pack and putting it on his opponents. And doing his young lion roles, so like <laughs> clearly he, he's still you know his Titan Tron young lion when he's running out there with the music. So uh, I think yeah. until he that's gone and he can keep the black trunks, but until they change his music and uh, and that and he stops running out and doing putting ice bags on people he's beating up, I, I think that he's still quote unquote still a young lion. Yeah. Uh, Ethan Faber says he needs a theme. That's it. Uh, Red and Rita didn't feel like a young lion despite dressing like it. Fuck you, Ethan Saber. You don't know shit. He needs spikes <laughs> and flames on his gear. Not a theme. The theme doesn't matter. Put some spikes on him. <laughs> Give him some face paint. Give him a, a fucking barbed wire print on his gear. <laughs> oh, we got another comment. Angel Rivera. Maybe they forgot to tell him he's not a young lion. <laughs> <laughs> or, or maybe it's a rib. They're just they're playing the young lion music just just to mess yeah. with <laughs> You can say where the young boy is spoken. Bro, listen, I'm nobody. I'm just a fucking I don't know who it was. Someone was in our Discord and they were talking about um they got tickets sold to them from a Joshua Smith. Um at some point and they were wondering if it was me and they're like if it was him then it'd be like a collector item i'm like based off what i'm just a fucking dude bro bro you're you're one half of the ace of podcast what do you mean <laughs> yeah i guess so it, it is do you ever think that it's weird that like one day not to get weird but like one day we're gonna die and all of this all these hours of content is just gonna exist out there in cyberspace unless Unless we stop hosting and paying for it, I guess it might disappear. But like, it's just kind of weird that like there are thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of you and me just talking about <laughs> fucking New Japan out there. What's on the internet? No, yeah, we'll be out there. <laughs> Is this like the greatest thing we've ever done with our lives? <laughs> uh, I don't know about all that, but <laughs> it's definitely uh, one of our accomplishments. This is, this is our legacy, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, next question here from Rambone says, "Do you feel that pushing two young talents forward out of the G one playing tournament is the kind of empathetic statement that need to be made about the state of NJPW? Is this a marker that we are turning the corner out of the uneven pandemic and early post pandemic era?" That's a great point, and I mean, you know, uh, on the one hand, obviously, I'm I'm lamenting the idea that some of the staples of the G one aren't getting their just do opportunity uh, because I want to see great matches. But at the same time, like we know Tai Chi is not going to win it. We know that 
Ishii and Yoshihashi. As much as I want a fantasy book, Ishii winning the whole fucking thing, which I still think that they should have gone that way. Um, they're not going to. So at least with this, it is that fresh young direction that people have so desperately been seeking for a long time. Now, again, if they treat these guys like young boys and, and ha- give them severely losing records by the end of it all, I do think that will be a huge misstep. But that's not to say that, um, you know, that th- this is extremely exciting one way or the other. And it, I think it is something where people can uh, kind of buy in to both of these these guys. Here's the only thing about it. And I'll, I'll kick it over to you, Jeremy. They're both white guys. It is kind of weird that we like we don't have this excitement kind of brewing around one of the like domestic young lions that could have been put in the same position. We got like, you know, two uh two uh you know foreigners uh kind of being put in this position, which is kind of unique too. Yeah, which I think you know they kind of need to reload and push some of their own uh foreign talent and yeah, I mean, like we mentioned, you know, Shomakato and Murashima, they're not ready yet, and then we just had uh, the two other new young lions um, debut. So yeah, I don't really think there was any quote unquote young Japanese talent. It's not, I mean, all the, the you know the pillar Raywell guys are already in it. So I don't know if there wasn't really anybody else Japanese to push it then that way. But um, I think it also helps too that like Tanahashi did this whole big press conference of we need to push the young guys, we need to put the young guys in big spots, and then there was actually follow through very quickly after. So it it kind of seems like you know. Tanahashi was kind of getting his feet wet first few months in the office. And like now he's like pulling the trigger of like, all right, I got my game plan. This is what we're doing. Sorry, Gato, you know, rip up your notebook. This this is the game plan. You need to push these young guys. The ace trigger. <laughs> Yo, I'm going to, I'm going to run to the restroom. You keep going. <laughs> all right. Uh, Ram bones also says uh, this G one season has me feeling the vibes. How about you guys? Yes. Uh, I am definitely a feeling the vibes, Rambones. Uh, there's a, there's a lot of buzz and excitement right 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 uh, around New Japan right now, and it feels great because it feels like we haven't had this kind of buzz and enthusiasm from the crowd uh, for the fans, I should say, um, in quite some time. And so it feels really good. There's a lot of energy and excitement around G1. And uh, speaking of G1, uh, front of the show, Chris Sampson, like I mentioned, he's going to be on the show. Next week to uh, break down G1 for us, but he's also running his uh, sport of pro wrestling G1 bracket contest. I think the link should be live by the time uh, you guys are here. Well, you guys are live. You're hearing it right now. I think it should be live, but um, when it's audio drops, the audio version drops, it should be live on his site, sport of pro wrestling dot com. I got to uh, preview this thing today. And guys, this this is great. Like I like New Japan should be paying Chris for this uh, site in this in this contest gimmick that he built here, and it, it once you guys see it, it's super smooth. Like it, it adds up the scores for you. You can go through the dates, make your predictions. Like this thing is so slick, and of course, with it being Chris, the stats are built in there. There's a little drop down. You click stats. You see the head to head. You see all this great information. Uh, so definitely go to sportofprowrestling.com. See if the contest is live. Check that out. We'll probably plug it more again next week. Um, I don't know what all the prizes are. I think uh, Josh and I are going to throw in uh, to give a prize for the contest as well. But uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, it's always fun making the pick em and doing your predictions and all of that good stuff. So check that out, sportofprowrestling.com. Uh, next question here from the Discord Daddy, MJ. says, what do you do with these newly down cycle vets Ishii, Yoshihashi, and Taichi definitely feel like they can still contribute meaningfully to NJPW, but others I don't know. When it comes to contract season, would you renew someone like Kenta or let him walk? Um, you're already you're already at MJ's answer. You didn't wait for me. Hey, you said keep going, so I, I answered Rambo's <laughs> other question. I, I plugged. Uh, the, the G1 contest uh, Sam's was going to oh, be running. Yeah. yeah. You, uh, you filled that out today. It, uh, you said it was, it looks really good. Yeah. It, it's great, easy, sleek uh, experience. Uh, it, it's, like I was saying, I think new Japan, they should be paying Chris for 
this. Like, this is like the best, like any kind of like round robin contest thing. Well, I, I asked Chris, I said, how do we make money off of his contest? <laughs> he wasn't clear with me on that. But uh, no, but uh, for real, if you guys, um, I know Chris is looking for um, potentially maybe prizes. So if there's anything that you guys can think of related to this show that you might want to see donated to the Pick'em contest that he's running over there at uh, Sport of Pro Wrestling, let us know. Hit us up in the Discord. Hit us up on Twitter, where wherever you might contact us, and uh, maybe we can somehow, you know, partner up with Chris and and uh, you know support what he's doing over there. Um, to speak to uh, MJ's question, though, um, yeah, I mean it, it's it's exactly like what what we've been saying over and over during this discussion is like there are certain guys that are being downcycled. Uh, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that will add motivations and and character uh arcs to the the rest of their year after the g1 passes and we can see them work their way back up into some of these guys could even potentially next year not even be in the qualifier they might just outright get into the g1 because they have a turnaround year based off of this uh this failure here i don't know but um it, it is interesting that there's a lot of guys we wanted out of the g1 they're out and along with them we had to see at least three or four guys that our beloved not make it right and you know as far as like do you re-sign a guy like kenta i think it just kind of depends on you know what the financial situation is i know that they're still trying to uh you know recoup and build a business up i mean i wouldn't break the bank for kenta but i mean he's still a a big name in japanese wrestling i think he's a, a good veteran hand you could have on the car i don't think he needs to be pushed or anything but he's a guy that could help you know he he did a great job with Callum Newman, helped, helped him have a really good match there. He's a guy that has that knowledge. I mean, he's a guy you can throw on these New Japan Strong shows. I think that that would be um, a draw here in in the U.S. Um, so, yeah, I think this really depends on what, what the – I mean, who knows? Maybe Kenta's like, you know what? I cause Kenta's doing a lot of USAs too. Maybe he's like, you know what? I want to do the Suzuki thing. I'm just going to do Defy. I'm going to do MLW. I'm You know, I'm going to just do U.S. Indies for the rest of my career. I mean, I wonder how many – ROH tapes Tony Khan has seen of Kenta and how he feels about bringing him in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, who knows? Again, you know, we're seeing Ishii come in um, this Wednesday for that uh, global four way. Yeah, who knows? Maybe Kenta will. Tony Khan, we saw Kenta come in during the um, that John Moxley feud when the, the Forbidden Door was quote unquote first open. So who knows? Yeah, maybe they bring Kenta in for some dates as well. But, you know, I, I don't want to speculate on. Uh, I think part of it is like, what kind of value does Kenta bring? And some of that is not necessarily discernible by Western voices. Cause we don't know what that fan base, that audience and, and you know, what, what's going on with their, their money, what that looks like over there. Maybe he is a difference maker and it would make sense to continue to uh, pay him and keep him on the payroll and some of those other guys too. But uh, maybe not so much. It's hard to say. Yeah. Uh, next question here from Dark Soldier. How did you feel about the qualifying matches as a concept? I personally feel it's been a long time coming. They give some people a chance to still wrestle but not clog up a G1 entry. Plus, it gives the late June tour a bit more life. What do you think? I, I agree with all those. I think those are positive points. I think some of the negative points is uh, those same individuals who are clearly not going to make it into the G1. It might be demotivating to some extent for them because it's uh, it's art imitating or life imitating art where like they're being booked to not make it, but they're really not going to make it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, it's not like, a, although I thought the tournament was, was good because it was new, it was a new concept. It had real stakes. Uh, there, there were a lot of uh, great storylines coming out of it. And so I thought it was very intriguing but the the match quality itself overall wasn't you know extremely high necessarily not that it needed to be but i do wonder how demotivating it might be for some individuals to to learn like you know this is where i am in the hierarchy and i'm not going to make this thing and at the same time for some people it might have been a motivator for them to learn like you know like that night where ishii and and yoshihashi seem to have you know, uh, a point to prove. So um, I think there's some positives, some, some negatives, but I think it's overall mostly a positive thing. 
Yeah, I think it's been great. Yeah, it's definitely added some life to this uh, June time period, which is usually kind of a downtime before we get into G1. And so, again, adding stakes to this tour, to these matches, um, I think it was definitely a needed thing. And it has people more tuned in, locked in, you know, do big title matches, do big tournament stuff like this. So, yeah, it's uh, been really good for this tournament. And, um, you know, you you can't do this in, in every locker room. You know, some people have a hard time getting their guys to do jobs. So Mm -hmm. the fact that they're able to even pull this off and have these uh, veterans put the young guys over is actually a pretty big deal. (laughs) You heard what I said? I said, Tony. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah. Some people, they don't don't like to do jobs. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, So uh, speaking of uh, not doing jobs, uh, next match up here. (laughs) <laughs> we had a 30-minute uh, time limit draw. We had LIJ versus LIJ. We're in the hometown of Tetsuya Naito and Bushi. We had Bushi, Shingo, and Naito against Hiromu, Teton, and Suji. And uh, the ending match, uh, ending part of the match, really focusing in on uh, Hiromu and Naito, something that's been teased for years now. We were supposed to get it. At the anniversary show in 2020, and then the the world uh, blew up with uh, COVID, and they never went back to the match. Well, you know, um, I th- I was a little surprised that they went with an all Lij six man tag here. Um, you know, obviously Shingo and Naito are in the same block, even though they're on the same team here. I thought maybe this was adding a little bit of uh, some tension potentially there. Uh, like competitiveness between those two guys, even though they're on the same team. Obviously, Yoda Suji is also in the G1 and he's in a different block, but uh, maybe kind of hinting at the idea, potentially not saying it's going to happen, but potentially we might see competition between these three guys down the road. Um, I think a lot of people who are really into LIJ probably really enjoyed this match to me. I wasn't really one of those. And it's not that I don't enjoy LIJ or anything like that, but I thought it was just so they were showing their hands so clearly from the very beginning that this was going to a 30 minute draw and it felt closer to like three mini matches than it did um, like a cohesive, you know, six man tag team match with a lot of action and, um, you know, usually I credit Chris Charlton. I think, he, and you know, I think he does a great job. But he did bring up multiple times that there had they had a thirty minute time limit, and so it was like kind of like telegraphing the whole time, like that this might go the whole time. Um, other people are probably going to be higher on this than me. I just I felt it a bit monotonous, and I also wasn't totally quite sure why it was even happening in the first place. Yeah, I think it's just uh, a way to kind of do a special match for Naito and Bushi in their hometown, kind of a homecoming thing, kind of the rare LIJ versus LIJ matchup. I mean, I thought it was good for what it was. Um, I didn't think they were going to do a draw at first. I thought for sure that Teton was going to eat a pin and have the hometown team of uh, Naito and Bushi and Shingo win, Uh, but they decided to go to the draw thing. I thought it was very compelling of the whole Naito Hiromu thing, especially you had people on Twitter talking about, oh, you know, it's dumb that people want Hiromu to be a heavyweight and be and be pushed. And it's like, look, look what they're showing you. They're showing Hiromu hang, almost pinning the world champion and now doing backstage comments saying he wants to never title so he can do a title versus title match against Naito. So clearly there is some interest in doing that and we've talked about it for years now like there's only so much you could do with Hiromu in your junior division he's a top star and I I think experimenting with him in open weight you know I see no complaints about people uh, with TJP doing open weight stuff so why is there issues with Hiromu doing open weight stuff and being pushed to face more heavyweights I don't get it well you know me I don't live on Twitter and I'm not usually privy to what's going on but I did see a tweet from uh Kieran and um if you guys don't know Kieran, he's like one of the, he was one of the better content creators. Well, he does create good content, but what I mean is like, he was mainly known for all the gifts that he posted until like, uh, 
Bushi Road like cracked down on that shit and like just ruined his stuff. But like, uh, yeah, I, I love the stuff, the podcast that he does. Uh, and I don't know all the channels and everything, but I've been on one of his shows in the past. But I saw the tweet that he put out, and I know that that one got a lot of steam where it said like, if you're, um, like if you're lobbying for, uh, Hiromu to go heavyweight like you're telling on yourself and mm-hmm. I was like how are you telling on yourself <laughs> yeah I was like what <laughs> what, what does that fucking mean <laughs> and I, I feel like that was a really controversial tweet but like to me I don't know like I feel like it makes sense like Hiromu has wrestled heavyweight he's been in tournaments where he's beaten heavyweights in the past I don't think it's that outlandish a thing he was you know booked at one point for the anniversary show as a junior to face off against the, the heavyweight champion in um, Naito, which is like, yes, there is a, there is a junior versus heavyweight um, tradition there, but how many of those juniors, how many of them use that match to catapult to heavyweight in the future? Like Prince Devitt did. Uh, we saw Will Ospreay do that. Uh, we see, you know, we've seen several people utilize that match as a means to make the jump. I, I don't think it's that far fetched that Hiromu would have. And like you said, there there are very few more things for him to accomplish at at junior. But I think the most damning thing about it is that he's competed at heavyweight quite a bit and beaten people and gone deep in tournaments. So right, he was in the I New Japan Cup 2020. He had a world title match with Evil. Uh, in that year as well and yeah he's been other you know open weight stuff and I get it maybe you want to blame the pandemic for that but yeah we had the pandemic but they they showed that they had the faith in him to wrestle with those heavyweights and beat some of those heavyweights and he's a top star like there's only so many more times that he could win super juniors and win the junior title uh, and do that whole dog and pony show over and over again well, you know, and again, I don't want to like put words in his mouth because I don't know exactly the full context, what he was implying, you know, but and I like Kieran. I think that he is a, you know, pretty beneficial member of like the new Japan community. And I like the guy, but I also was wondering like, why, why the fuck you say you're telling on yourself? Does he not know what telling on yourself? Like actually, I, I, I don't know. There's, there's a context to like what telling on yourself means. And I don't think he, <laughs> he's used to it right. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, "How are they telling on themselves? Do you know what that means?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then but, the, and then the yeah. next day, Hiromu almost pins Naito <laughs> in the main event. Right, right. <laughs> Which you know, there's a lot, and maybe there was a bit of an element. Maybe I was overlooking. Like, obviously, I like I said, I wasn't as big on this match as a lot of other people were. Um, but maybe there is an element where they're testing the water a little bit to see if there is still a little bit of juice to the idea behind Hiromu and um, Naito. And uh, I don't know, man, like uh, part of me is like, why wasn't her at this point? Why, why wasn't Hiromu like in the fucking G1? You know, if that's the way they're thinking about potentially going with things, you know? Yeah. He would be a great guy to put in these G1 qualifiers to earn his spot and get in there. Um, That would be a good shout for next year. Yeah. Uh, Potentially. Two questions here on this match. Uh, Lee Chang is Bay 2 says, how confident are you guys in Naito performing to a grade one level in this year's G1? Not going to lie, that Moxley match was ugly. I feel bad sometimes about the things that we say about Naito on the show because I feel like we get a rap that we hate Tetsuya Naito. And I mean, I can go on record and say, I don't hate Tetsuya Naito. Like, and, and I'm not saying that in bad faith. I mean, I, there have been times where I've been high on Tetsuya Naito as a fan. I don't know about, I mean, Jeremy, you could speak for yourself, but like, I feel like you have been a fan of Naito in the past, right? Yeah. I've, I've enjoyed Naito. You know, we saw him uh, in Ibushi, Madison Square Garden. We've seen, uh, you know, that match of uh, Kenny and Ibushi in Daytona. Like we've seen Naito live several times, great, you know, chanting for him, supporting him and, He's had a lot of great matches in the history of this show. So, yeah, I mean, I've always been high on him, but like we know, we come out here, we tell the truth, and we're not just just just, <laughs> just because we we like the guy and he's had great matches in the past. I, that I'm not going to stop what I, I what I what I see and tell the truth about his performances. Yeah, we we are truthful. If if nothing else, we are truthful on this fucking show, and I feel like one of the reasons we get a bad rap about our our thing with Naito is because we. 
we are telling it like it is. And we have been early on this Naito thing early be, before everybody else. And I, I, I know we put ourselves over and everything like that and, and whatever, but we have been one of the only shows that covers new Japan that has been like, this guy has been washed. And we were saying this four to five years ago. And if you look at his track record, does he year over year, does he have a, sh- a match, a couple matches where he pulls it out with the right opponent and really deliver big? Yes. But by and large, most singles matches with Tetsu Naito year over year, and it's been diminishing as time has gone on, have been bad. You know, realistically, they have been. And he's had this, um, you know, the thing that you hear a lot of like pundits say is that he's a big match performer, which means like <laughs> that's the kind of thing that people, you know, I remember people used to say about like uh, Shawn Michaels when he was in his like, uh, you know, in, in his second iteration of his career. And and it was fitting because like on the big matches, he would try, but like week in and week out, like Sean wasn't fucking trying, you know, but that was closer to like the Nakamura thing. Nakamura was the same way. Nakamura was like not really putting forth effort most of the time. And then big show, big match, he'd go and blow it out of the water. Naito doesn't have that ability anymore. Naito can only do something like that with the right opponent who can carry him to those types of matches. And Naito doesn't have Okada and you know fucking will osprey and kenny omega to carry him to those types of matches anymore at this and jay white and kota Ibushi. you know he doesn't have his dance partners to do that naito has been getting washed for a long time we were early on it we've been calling it out and now it has become extremely apparent and i feel like for us it's like other, I think other shows are coming to that realization just now, but we were there five years ago. Yeah, we, we've been we talking did. about the, the wrapped up knees and uh, the, the, some of those, you know, those uh, Suzuki matches for the IC title. Like, the, the, there were some singles matches that were just like, eh. And then, yeah, of course, yeah, he's in there with also, you know, Will Ospreay, Okada, Bushi, Kenny. Of course, he's going to have incredible matches. And I'm not putting it on all, all of them. Of course, you know, he did his part too, but. Now it's 2024. The, the knees are worse. The eyes are worse. Um, I'm sure he probably has other pains that we don't know about. And he doesn't have the super high level workers to go out there with to be able to get him to that next level. And we saw that with this the Moxley match at Forbidden Door and even the Winnie City Riot match, which that match was better than the Forbidden Door match with, due to that kind of the, the, the atmosphere and some of the stuff they did there, but that forbidden door match. You kind of feel like Mox might be getting to a point where he's got a lot of miles on his body too, and is not maybe performing the way he was even a year ago. I think I'm, kind of, I'm kind of feeling that way. There could be something to that too. Plus, I I don't know if he's super motivated right now either. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's some rumors about that too. Yeah, but um, uh, to put it in a nutshell, it's like. I know it's like par for the course for us to be like, fuck Naito. He's not going to do good. But like, we've been there. We've already been there. We've been there for a long time. (laughs) And now everybody else is just now starting to catch up to the, to the point where it's like, I understand Naito biggest star in the company ticket mover, you know what he means to the Puro intelligentsia to those people that see him as like their poster child. And they, live and breathe with the guy and from a character and a and and a storyline standpoint i get it and that's not to say that he's not a great wrestler and it bro when when naito was in his prime prime one of the best guys in the entire world but like he's not in his prime anymore and he doesn't have the right dance partners anymore and he don't have knees anymore and he barely has a neck and a back anymore he's got no biceps he wears a t-shirt most of the time he hardly can move and he's had to have corrective eye surgery three times and he can't have it again. And if he does fuck up his eye again, he's going to be blind permanently for the rest of his life. How much tread is on the tires? And we were saying this five years ago. <laughs> after this the, is not, after it's not the, new. After the first eye surgery. <laughs> yeah, after the first eye surgery. <laughs> this is not new. And, you know, while other people were crying about, you know, 
him not getting his ace run and talking about, you know, him and Kenny and him and the roll call. And roll call and, you know, G.O.D. and blah, 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 blah. We were like, bro, there's a working standard in this company and he can't go night in and night out the way Kota Ibushi does. And he can't go in night in and night out the way, you know, Katsuyori Shibata does or Tomohiro Ishii or, you know, uh, Kenny Omega or fucking Okada. But like there were like 10 dudes that were all better than him when everyone wanted to crown him the, the heir apparent. When they wanted him make wanted to make him the top guy, there was like 10 guys that were all better than him. And, and you know, and then he got lapped by Will. And he got lapped by Shingo, you know. <laughs> yeah. He got lapped by Ibushi. These guys all got better than him. And he got older and he got broken down and it is unfortunate. And I wish the pandemic never happened. And I wish he got the run that you guys wanted him to have. But like, there's a reason that everyone complained. Oh, what is this John Moxley title run? You know, what does this do for the company? And I get it. I'm right there with you. But what was the alternative? We're going to, we're going to break, we're going to break fucking John Moxley <laughs> before the G1 happens. You have this man Naito bumbling around out here and his, you know, 30 minutes of spitting and throwing elbows. Yeah, bro. So do I think that we're going to get grade one level performances out of uh, uh, Naito? Like, nah, bro. What year well, was it when we're, we're guaranteed probably at least two? He's he's got Shingo and Zach in that a block. And, and you know what? That's the funny thing. I was going to say the only two guys that can really get gold out of him in these days are Naito and, and, and uh, Shingo. And we've only seen one Shingo match, but I'm just basing it off the fact that it's fucking Shingo and mm -hmm. how good the first match was and the history with them and both being animal Hamaguchi uh, trainees and everything like that. And then Zach is Zach. Zach's like the one guy, but even their matches have like diminished as time has gone on as well. So we'll see. All right, so he's got one then with Ching. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna, that's, a, that's gonna be an interesting narrative to watch. There's gonna be people if if this. I know Jeremy's probably already like ready to clip this shit up to talk about <laughs> <laughs> put on fucking YouTube. And there's gonna be some people that love Naito, and I know like Trish is listening, and Naito's her boy, and I get it. There's there's some people out there that fucking love him. I mean, there's some stan 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 accounts out there and 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 it's rightfully so he's a compelling character with a great story and a great gimmick but to me it's about the fucking stars <laughs> <laughs> where the stars at oh. and, and this man doesn't have okada and will osprey the two greatest wrestlers alive in the world today to carry him you know maybe if he was in there with Takeshita, it'd be a different story but i don't think we're getting to that point you know uh, best we can give him is a shingo and, and a zach we'll see how that goes yeah let, let's hold on let me pull up his uh whole block here <laughs> let, let, let's see what so okay so he's, bro, he's got sonata again. bro those sonata matches yeah, and I, even I liked the first one, but bro, he's got evil again. Yikes! He's got Jake Lee again. Yikes. I like, I didn't, bro, I didn't barely watched any of those matches, so I don't even know. Yeah, he didn't miss anything. He's, he got Gabe Kid, maybe. Gabe Kid is gonna beat the fuck out of me too, <laughs> on principle. Yeah. Oh, he's got uh, Ocon. He's got Ocon. He's got Umino again. How good was that Umino match? That they went like forty minutes <laughs> stuck. Yeah. So yeah, it, it's yes, yeah, yeah. Shingo and Zach are our only hopes. Save us, Zach. <laughs> uh, Less Commission seven two five two says, "Do you think we will still get that Naito versus Hiromu match at some point down the line?" In the Naito and Bushi VTR, they reference that the two were meant to face each other in 2020, but was canceled due to the pandemic. They continue to build up the possible match between these two, but knowing New Japan. We will. Will we ever eventually see the match? Um, they probably should do it. I mean, if there's one big money match that's still on the table for the company that could do big business on some level, that's probably one of them. They would be dumb not to do it, right? Yeah, I, that's a. I think it's a huge money match, and I think they could draw well. And maybe they're now trying to save that for the right place, right time. But again, with Naito's health, I think that 
right place and right time needs to come pretty soon. <laughs> uh, Bro, and not just his health, Hiromu's health. Let's not pretend like he's a spring chicken either. Right, but I feel like he's kind of transitioned into like this kind of more of a power junior. You know, he's doing more lariats, more submissions uh, compared to like throwing his body around like he's used to doing. Yeah, and he's not as good. <laughs> Yeah, the matches have not been as high level, but I, I would he's definitely, I think, a, a few steps ahead of Naito, though. Well, no, I'm not saying he sucks, but I'm saying, like, it's not what it could have been. Let me put it to you this way. Like, in 1993, we were supposed to get Hulk Hogan versus Bret Hart at SummerSlam. Shit didn't happen. They had a one-on-one match in 1998 on Nitro. It went, like, six minutes <laughs> and it ended in DQ, and, and nobody cared. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that it was different. <laughs> different. <laughs> oh man. So yeah, hopefully they they do do the match. I, I think that multi man match was a tease for it, and Hiromu doing the comments of wanting to face uh, Hanare for the Never Title to do a title versus title match, and you know we got two dome shows coming up. So who knows? We'll, we'll see what happens. Oh God, <laughs> I don't even know, bro. I'm not even that. We'll talk about it, but. I don't know if I'm that high on the idea of two dome shows back to back in that context. Yeah. Well, we'll get to it in a second. Uh, let's talk about the main event here first. We had the uh, IWGP Junior Heavyweight title match. Doki defeating El Desperado to become the new junior champion. 21 minutes and 47 seconds from the mud holes in Mexico. To the championship in the Tokyo Budokan, Doki did it. You know, Jeremy. Here's the funny thing with this. Okay, I I definitely did not think Doki was beating Desperado here, but he's also never beat Desperado, and it was like what we talked about earlier, where like when someone just keeps getting beat and beat, and they keep getting closer and closer, and there's like this overarching story between the guys. Like you kind of almost sort of had to think in the back of your head, like is there a shot Doki wins fucking right here? Like surely they're not going to take the belt off of uh Desperado, like, you know, weeks into his title reign. Lo and behold, the second long, the second shortest title reign in the history of the junior title. Mm-hmm. In New Japan. <laughs> Doki wins the title here. Um, I would love to be able to run around and say, not only was this shocking, but it was also the greatest match between these two guys. But I honestly think this was on the lower spectrum of, of the match, not to bury the match. The match was good, but we just saw an excellent match between them. Like last month in, in the qualifiers for the super juniors. And I thought that that match along with some of the other matches they've had recently were much better. This was pretty good. The, the, the finish was excellent. Um, but I don't think it lived up to some of the level of matches they've had in the recent past, honestly. Yeah, I mean, it's probably not, not definitely not their best match, but um, I thought it was a, a really good matchup, and I thought they told a good story. Desperado working over the knee to set up the uh, Pinche Loco, or the no, no Numero Dos, um, and Doki was working over the neck. He did several... Yep. DTs to the outside, Tope, uh, Tornado DTs to Desperado. And it all came down to the end where Despi, he goes uh, for uh, a dragon suplex, lands on his neck, trying to do, I think actually a German a German suplex, lands on his neck doing the bridge. and He couldn't, couldn't capitalize on it. Yeah, until the neck was hurt, Doki was able to hit a regular dragon suplex and then the suplex de la luna, bridging dragon suplex, Drop Despi right on that neck. One, two, three, and gets the win here. Yeah, and I mean, say what you will about the uh, the match was very good. I, I I'm used to these guys having like top tier matches. This wasn't maybe quite there, um, but the story itself was simple enough and and very satisfying. But the finish was quite a fucking moment, and like I think people were gen- genuinely shocked here. I know I was, um, and like. <laughs> We got a lot of questions about it. So, I mean, I, I'll, I'll save, you know, my comments, but like, I, I don't know, man, like this was such, this was pretty awesome. Just feeling like <laughs> Dan Coffin, <laughs> Doki ain't going back, you know, when the whole world was calling this man Dookie because it was funny to say that his name sounded like shit because he was a shit wrestler in the 2019 
uh, best super juniors. And I was like, I'll just say it. I was one of the first ones right then where I was like, I don't know, bro. He's kind of wrong. Like, <laughs> I, I, I was like, he's got something. Did I ever think that that guy would be standing here holding the top tier title? No, I never, ever. I would love to say I did, but I didn't. But I did think that there was something special about him. And over the years, we have grown to be more and more Doki fans on this show and supporters. And now here we are all these years later, five years later. And he's the fucking man. Like he's he's the the fucking champion. And and it came. I don't know, man. Like I don't know if this was planned or not because it's pretty clear that they've had big plans for Doki all year. Like from having him beat Hiromu, him be, becoming the number one contender, beating um, Fujita, his uh, excellent run through the uh, Super Juniors. But at the same time, it feels like it came out of nowhere. So I don't know if like plans change, brother. That doesn't work for me. Like, what the fuck happened here? Was this where it was supposed to happen? I don't know. But like the fact it happened, it's like this is this was a real like, do you believe in miracles moment? <laughs> like, you know, and he cut the promo at the end and saying, like, even for him, it was shocking to think that he's better than Desperado. But on this night, he's better than Desperado. And like right now, Doki, and and you know what, man? I'll just say it. And and this is gonna piss some people off. And this is not meant to be disrespectful, but there are some people that just fucking love Desperado, like love him. They think he, there are a lot of shows, a lot of pundits, a lot of fans that are like, he is a top tier, one of the top 10 best wrestlers in the world. Some of them would, them would put him on the short list, like top five. And many people think he's the best. I don't even think he's the best junior in the company. I've thought for many years now that Doki in my Honest, humble opinion. I think Doki is the hardest working and best junior in the world. And I know that I I know when I say that, that I'm saying that he's better than <laughs> like some of the best guys out there, like a, like a Robbie Eagles or like a Desperado or a Hiromu or, you know, uh, like a Francesco Akira. But like he just puts it all fucking on the line every time that he's out there. And now He's not, he's no longer wrestling to not go back because he's fucking here. He's established and he's the man. And like the chances that he doesn't have to worry about going back to, if he goes back to Tijuana, it's because he wants to go back <laughs> to work on the dirt floors because that's his prerogative because he's the man now. Yeah. People need to put respect on the name. No more Dookie or Dokai. Like this man is, his name is Doki. You put respect <laughs> on his name. He's earned the respect. Uh, we had a question here. I forgot to put it on the rundown. Uh, came from Barry Walsh. Uh, he says, as up and down as it can be seeing Doki win, it made me wonder, does anyone tell a journey arc as well as New Japan? Uh, for better or for worse, whether it's intentional or not, just because of the nature of how New Japan tells their stories, how their wrestling is laid out, and how much sometimes headcanon is like, you know, kind of placed or, you know, put on the shoulders of the fans to kind of create, maybe no, you know, and if there is, it's probably a company like stardom or something like that. Something that I'm not as, uh, you know, um, engaged in or, uh, knowledgeable about. Yeah. I think also new Japan, incredible story and, and building guys up. And yeah, I think this Doki story has been so great coming in as a replacement last minute replacement in the 2019 Super Juniors, and then, yeah, literally every year, working his way up, scratching and clawing, getting one more point, getting one more victory, getting slid into bigger spots, and just kind of slowly, just kind of moving up, working hard, going hard every night, and it's moving his way up, and building to this point where it's like, it's very believable that, yeah, he's, you know, getting contender matches, he's getting title matches, you know, uh, he mentioned he had that contendership match earlier in the year and he challenged show. Like it was very believable that he was at the, that point and us wanting to see him win that. And so, yeah, definitely a great arc there for him. Uh, Death Triangle 20 with Doki as champion. Do you think the junior title can be won by anyone now? The fuck's that supposed to mean? <laughs> Sounds like some Doki disrespect. <laughs> Oh my God. Well, first off, it's the junior title. And the reality is as, as much as it is the most prestigious junior, you know, title that's out there in its 
long history, anybody that's in the division could hypothetically win it. I, I there's very few people. I mean, like Bushi's a former champion. You know what I'm saying? We like, we just had show House of Torture show show was, show was champion. Like <laughs> anybody can be champion. Um, I think the thing is like people didn't think Doki could be champion, and he 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 did. So um, I think that whatever Doki got paid on this night. He needs to take a, a large fraction of that and pay that to Jun Kasai because he would not be here without Jun Kasai breaking uh, Desperado's jaw all those years ago. Yeah. Uh, Dan says he was a doki doubter for a long time, but he won me over. I knew that man was over when kids were dressing as him in those Japanese crowds. <laughs> That's funny. Also, uh, Doki was ahead of the pandemic with the mask as well. <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, Lee Chang is Bay Two says I remember listening to your podcast a while back where you guys were rating NJPW guys on the Bret Hart scale, and Doki ended up having one of your lowest scores and got clowned <laughs> on <laughs> for looking like a Power Rangers villain. I know you guys like to be ahead, but was his me- meteoric rise to the top junior division surprising even to you? Oh, I will always stand by the fact that I think that he looks like a Power Rangers. Um, but like he looks like one of the Putty Patrol, you know, like he looks like one of the dudes when you're playing Streets of Rage and they just take the same pixel picture and they just put purple and red and yellow and green and they just <laughs> change them the colors. Slight, they change the colors and give them slightly different names. He looks like a Jag. Like that's, <laughs> that's never been in dispute. Of course, uh, Doki, if, if we did that today and we did the Bret Hart scale, Doki would still get one of the lowest scores because we are truth tellers on, on <laughs> keeping his strong style. <laughs> as much as I love the guy, like if I was, okay, like, let me just throw this out there. If I was like, for instance, love Floyd, one of my, one of my, one of our good friends, love love floyd johnson host of like uh uh all things elite but like with him and he'll say it un- unashamedly he's completely biased and if one of his favorite wrestlers wins a title five 15 million stars it's the greatest <laughs> match ever happened if, if i was that same way because i've said for a long time that doki's my favorite junior i'd be coming out here telling you guys how this broke the fucking you no know, it didn't break the scale like it, it wasn't the classic i wanted it to be like i would be lying to you guys but I'm not going to lie, as much as I love Doki, as much as I love his work, as much as I think he's the ultimate underdog, he would still score very low on the Bret Hart, you know, wrestler scale. <laughs> well, well, let's do it real quick. So, look. what? Well, okay, what are the criteria again? Because I so, forget. So, look, work, Mike, and we, we added it factor. Okay. So, for a look, it, it's always been low. I think the thing that changes it for Doki between now and the time we last did it was the concurso. Yeah. That man is ripped to fucking shreds, but he still hides it behind the gear. Now the gear has changed a little bit to where he has different, you know, variations of the gear. It's been upgraded. I'd probably go six. I I, I would go like six and a half. All right. That's fine. Six, six and a half. If he was showing the abs, if he was showing the body, you know, and I hate to sound like one of the girls from Tunnel Talk talking about like, exposing the body, but if he was showing the body, he'd probably be higher. But like, he's still low, man. It's still like six, six and a half. Yeah. All right. So, all right. Let's look. Uh, Mike, I mean, barely talks. I don't I mean, he, when he gets to the post match uh, main event promos, he's all right. I mean, we don't know what he's saying, though. <laughs> Five. Uh, I don't know. I I I gotta go six and a half too. Still with that team. Coffee goes plus two for the bent pipe. <laughs> <laughs> I can't go that high because he doesn't talk, and when he does, like he doesn't say that much. And it, you know, I watch the backstage comments, and I don't find him to be like a super compelling, you know, backstage comment guy. Okay, that's fair. Uh, so look, my uh, work nine. Yeah, solid nine. And then uh, it factor. That is probably the thing that has upgraded the most. Um, I don't know what we gave him before, but I would still. The it factor, that's a tough one because I feel like it 
I don't think that the first time you ever see him, it's going to like, if you just see the guy that it, it, you're going to be like, Oh, he's got this magnetic thing about him. But I also remember when he went to AW and he wrestled Darby Allen and he was getting cheered over Darby Allen, which is crazy. I'll go seven and a half. Yeah, that, that's about right. Yeah, I go uh, maybe seven, seven and a half. Yeah, somewhere, somewhere in that range. Isn't that what I said? Seven and a half. Yeah, seven and a half. I probably, uh, I don't know. I'm more like seven. So I'm at six plus five plus nine plus seven and a half. I'm at like twenty seven point five out of forty. That's <laughs> out of forty. That's not, you know, I, I'm basing most of my love on him based on his work more so than anything else. I mean, the man's still Doki. He still looks like Doki. <laughs> <laughs> but when you get the, you know, the nine in the work and you bring the stars. That's, that's all you need is to procure the stars. That's all that really matters. <laughs> and then the, the bent pipe, like Dan says. I don't know. I, Dan, I feel like Dan mentioning the bent pipe. I don't know. What? <laughs> I don't know. Bent pipe. Bent, I don't know. I'm not going to say anything. Uh, next question here from uh, Let's Commission Seven Two Five Two. Let's go ahead and have Doki represent the strong style logo. I just simply solve your Okada problem. I don't want to pay anybody to create a new logo. Well, uh, <laughs> I, don't wanna, I don't want to pay to put a new logo on this shit. And we, we can have uh, multiple uh, versions of the logo. Dan says Doki gets points for the shampoo commercial too. That's true. Yeah, that, that, that might up the look. Doki with the good hair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure uh, you know Zach Porter wouldn't mind sliding in a, a Doki uh, shadow. Andrew Rivera has got a, a question on the YouTube. Do you think Doki winning the belt plays into whatever Tai Chi is doing? Oh, that's a that's an interesting theory, possibly. Maybe it seems like just five guys is kind of in Dead. flux. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or just kind of, I don't know, they're on the back burner right now. And so, yeah, maybe this is going to be a bigger shakeup coming. That's not his fault. He sucks. <laughs> uh, Discord Daddy says, uh, let's hear it for our guy, Doki. Quick question Where was just five guys, not even Tai Chi, there to celebrate with his boy? Damn. That's true. Maybe uh, here's the thing. I don't want to um, throw shade on them. They probably just didn't think you would win. <laughs> they went to the hotel. Uh, <laughs> in kayfabe, in kayfabe, it wouldn't make sense for them to be out there because they wouldn't actually think he was going to win. You know what I mean? So it makes sense that they wouldn't be there. Yeah. You know, they wrestled early in the night. You're like, yeah, he's not going to win. Let's pack it up. Let's head to the hotel early. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They go to Twitter like what? <laughs> he won. Like, like, oh shit, he won. <laughs> Hell yeah, brother. <laughs> They're at Ribera Steakhouse eating. Oh <laughs> uh, well, that's it for all the questions on uh New Japan Soul G1 qualifiers. Uh any final thoughts, young boy, on uh G1 qualifiers, New Japan Soul? Nope. I just gotta get my dog under these covers. <laughs> okay. Um, I think we had some other questions here from uh, Barry Walsh that got emailed in. Um, he says, very interesting to see Tai Chi get upset. He was either really upset or hell of an actor. After all, stuttering, pushing younger guys, this G1 feels r like a really new ground. Um, yeah, so again, I think that kind of plays into the whole relegation uh, thing there from, from Tai Chi. Okay, so that's it for New Japan Soul. Uh, next thing that we have before G1, this coming Saturday, we have Fantastica Mania Lucha Libre USA, July 13th. It's going to happen in uh, Mount Pleasant High School in San Jose, California. So we have a... Uh, yeah, um, we're going to MLW the night before that, huh? Yeah, Friday night, MLW here in uh, St. Pete, Blood and Thunder. We got our media credentials locked and loaded. Uh, Ken that's going to be like. <laughs> Kenta will be in action against Bobby Fish in the first round of the Opera Cup. Uh, Bobby Fish. Oh, the anti-CM the anti, the anti -CM Punk match. Yes. Uh, Bad Dude Tito has a uh, first round match. Mystico has a first round match in the Opera Cup. 
I've never seen Mystico live that I can recall. Same here. So that's going to be uh, pretty fun. So, yeah. Yeah. So um, now let me ask you this Fantastic Mania show. Is this airing on New Japan World or is this a pay-per-view? What's the deal with that? That That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know. No. And I haven't really seen them say either. Um, let's see. Let's go to, I guess, New Japan's Twitter might be the best place. I'm going to New Japan World. <laughs> All right, so here we go. Here we go. It's a uh, special New Japan World pay per view. Oh my God, you got to pay for this. Sh- <laughs> $19.99. Oh, maybe we will. Maybe we won't. We'll see. Um, I'll, I'll do the rundown. So we got uh, eight matches of action here Friday night. Let's see if this is worth your $20 or not. Uh, Copa Fantastica four way match Viento versus Adrian Quest versus the DKC versus Kukui to open. The MLW World Tag Team title is on the line as Cozy Max, Akamura, and Satoshi Kojima defend against uh, Los Des- Depredadores, uh, Magnus, and Rugido. Uh, are the MLW Tag Titles on the line the night prior to that? I don't think so, but Kojima will be in action, and Magnus will be facing Mystico. Oh, okay, so, so they got a well, long flight. If, <laughs> if hypothetically they are on the line. I guess we should add the like caveat that if if Cozy Max are still the champions, then they'll defend the title. <laughs> uh, we have the CMLL World Women's title on the line as Stephanie Vaquer, the current champion, uh, defense against Yuvia. Uh, the fourth match of the night is a tag team match, Hetchy Saro and Virus versus TMDK, Bad Dutito and Zack Sabre Jr. Following that, we got uh, El Barbaro Cavernario versus Yotasuji. Uh, the semi-main event, Gabe Kidd versus Ultima Guerrero for the NJPW Strong Openweight title. And then the main event is a uh, Relevos Increbles tag team match, which basically means like guys that good guys and bad guys teaming up. So Rocky Romero and Volador Jr. versus Doki and Mystico. Um, and that is the card, which it, I mean, that's a cool card, but like, I'm sorry to say $20 <laughs> for that. I don't know, bro. That sounds to me like a New you Japan. For, you should get it for free on New Japan World. Period. Yeah, I feel like this is kind of like it's going to be a fun show, but as far as like the uh, quality, not quantity, like this is probably the first U.S. show in a while. It's not really hitting on the quality, and it's it's at a high school. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's cool. I, I like Fantastic Mania. Yeah, you know, I, I love that shit. But like, uh, I don't know, bro. Rocky and Volador versus Doki Mystico. Uh, Dan Coffin says, President Tanahashi needs that yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that's the only show we got coming up between now and next week. So I guess we have to we have to watch it and review it. We'll see. Yeah. We were supposed to review that Despy Invitational. Never mind that. <laughs> we're supposed to put that behind a paywall. I guess we didn't do that yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah. Anyways, let's move on. So we've got some news items here. So uh, in the news, during a press conference last Monday, NJPW President Hiroshi Tanahashi and Stardom President Taro Kata revealed details on the slate of events both promotions will hold leading to Wrestle Kingdom 19 on January 4th. Tanahashi said the key point of the week was to bring fans together across Japan and around the world. So uh, the, the announced events Sunday, December 29th, we have stardom at Ryagoku Sumo Hall, which my understanding that's usually like their biggest show of the year or one of them. Uh, Thursday, January 2nd, there will be pro wrestling Matsuri fan festival in uh, Belisal Haneda. Uh, following that Friday, January 3rd, Wrestle Kingdom 19 kickoff venue to be announced. Friday, January 3rd, Stardom New Year Dream, Tokyo Garden Theater. Saturday, January the 4th, will be Wrestle Kingdom 19 in Tokyo Dome. And then Sunday, January 5th, will be Wrestle Dynasty in Tokyo Dome. And then Monday, following that, will be January 6th, New Year Dash in Odaku Gymnasium. Uh, Tanahashi also announced steps for the reorganization of the IWGB governing body for title matches and tournaments within NJPW. The IWGB committee, which we've always joked on this show about the IWGB committee not really being a thing, but apparently it sounds like they're actually forming a real committee 
Uh, it will be composed of former IWGP champions as well as NJPW executives who will have uh, further announcements soon about their commitment to wrestlers and officiating in NJPW events. Do you think that evil is going to be on the IWGP committee? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I think there's going to be a lot of people who don't like evil that are going to be on that committee. <laughs> Maybe he needs to be on the committee as a dissenting voice to add, just add diversity. Maybe. You know, as I've been doing like research for like the Dominion Deep Dive and some of those interviews, they do mention like an IWGP committee. So I think at some point they must have, you know, tried to add some stakes to that and have that committee. I, where do you think I came? You think I just invented the committee? I, of course, they, they've always talked about a committee. I just don't think it was ever. I think the committee is just, you know, like not real. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But yeah, sounds like that's how she's going to make it real. Uh, overseas ticket sales have begun for G1 Climax 31 finals, so that's uh, on sale now. NJPW announced that the first ever tournament for the Oceania Cup will take place on August 16th at the Metro Social in Sydney, Australia. The Oceania Cup will, was originally scheduled to take place last year at Waga, North to South Wales. However, New Japan later announced that they would pull out of that tour with TNA taking its place. And JPW will hold a Tamashi event in Rolleston, Christchurch, New Zealand on July 28th at Rolleston College. And JPW is hiring native English speaking Tokyo era part area part time freelancers to join our digital media team. First um, assignment fix a website. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can fix the fucking website before you hire. Um, we had some people in the Discord like uh, say that we should be on that. And I was like, no oh here's the thing jeremy you you don't speak japanese obviously but everything and you don't live in japan but everything else that they'd be looking for in somebody to like actually work for them you fit the criteria you work in social media you're a, a fantastic writer like you you got your shit together you know the history you understand the product like you could easily do this job me not so much <laughs> don't understand technology can't run social media I fucking hate writing and I don't meet any of those other criteria. but like someone like you or like even uh, Karen Peterson or, you know, Chris Samsa, like there's quite a few people over here. I don't know why they have to live in Japan, but you know, I did the math and they're paying a, a basically the equivalent of like $150 a month for whatever it is, this freelance work that they got going on. But mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe even our good friend Fraser, he's over there in, in Japan. Maybe he could, you know, apply and, yeah. and work for them. But I don't know. I don't know if it's worth it to him. I don't know. But uh, if you are listening and you're in Japan, might want to, you know, apply. Uh, Saturday, August 24th, Rev Pros, 12th year anniversary show from the Copper Box Arena in London. Zack Sabre Jr. versus Hechicero was announced. I also think there was that Ishii and uh, who's he supposed to fight? I don't know. I saw it and I forgot to put that on the rundown. Um, let's see if I can find it real it, quick. It's somebody, but anyways, uh, Jeremy will have that in a moment. Uh, Friday or this uh, coming Friday, the, uh, July 12th, Kenta versus Bobby Fish from MLW Blood and Thunders take place. We'll be there live. JJ Gale. Be, oh, yeah, JJ Gale. Uh, West Coast Pro Championship match. Uh, Kevin Blackwood, the champion, is defending against Robbie Eagles. Uh, at a West Coast Pro versus Deadlock Pro Wrestling uh, X Prestige Wrestling event um, on Sunday or Saturday, July 20th. Uh, the event is called Untouchable. So uh, can't wait to see the new West Coast Pro champion, Robbie Eagles. Let's go. Uh, last bit of news. Y Yuto Nakashima has recovered from his injury and is back in action in Red Pro with Oscar Luebe. And that is going to do it for the news. we got a lot of... Uh, uh, questions here that we skipped over the last couple weeks, so it looks like we got to catch up on that shit. Yeah, let's run through these uh, real quick. Uh, first one, Rambones. It's a relationship between NJPW, uh, NJPW and NOAA in danger of ending due to conflicting partnerships on the side of each promotion. We do have a NOAA participant in the G1, but I don't know what Jake Lee's contract status actually is. Uh, we don't know anything. This is just conjecture, but I would imagine yes. I, I don't think that uh, WWE potentially strengthening their, uh, you know, partnership with Noah while at the same time, NJPW's primary Western partner is AEW, that that's going to jive. Yeah. I don't think they're going to be a huge fan of that. And especially when that whole announcement happened on, on a show where one of their guys was on, on you know, Gabe kid. So 
Yeah, I, I think down the line, you know, we said it from the get go, like this whole like UJPW stuff. We didn't think it was going to last very long, and yeah, especially now with Noah getting in bed with WWE, New Japan partner with AEW, there's definitely going to be some friction there. Uh, let's mention seven two five two. Why do you guys think the IWGP World Heavyweight Championship is never defending during World Tag League Finals? I get the title was defended on New Japan last big show, but it makes sense for a strong defense at the end of the month, then on to Road to Tokyo Dome that leads to Wrestle Kingdom. Uh, potentially, I mean, in, in his, in, in the history of new Japan, there was, a uh, you know, a long period of time where like the world champion always competed, uh, in the world tag league. And it's only in re- very recent times. So maybe the past five or so years where the IWGB champion wasn't on the tour and didn't actually compete in the world tag league. And instead of like transitioning that period to a time where they would have a final title defense. They just, you know, g- gave that period off to them or basically had them support in the undercard if necessary. But, uh, you know, I-, I could see that maybe there could be a some benefit, but at the same time, it's like, it's the one tour where the tag teams matter. Just like in May and June is the one time that the juniors get to headline. Like it's the one time that the tags get to headline. So yeah, you know, maybe, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm, let them have their, their one thing. And plus, I like having the dome main event already exactly. locked in, and then you can just build, do promos, interviews, media to really hype that thing up. Yeah, we've complained in the past about how New Japan doesn't do sometimes in certain situations the best job promoting. And can you imagine like what a cluster that would look like if like we don't know what the main event is going to be a week out from Wrestle Kingdom? They only have, you know the road to Tokyo, those three shows to, <laughs> to promote the main event. Like that would suck. Yeah. Cause the world tag league final is usually like December 15th, 20th time period to yeah, mm-hmm. and only have that little bit of time to push your domain event. Uh, I don't know if that would fly, but even if, you know, putting that aside, like, yeah, in numeric time, like, yes, there's time there, but there's only three shows really sometimes two. So if we're just, if the only time that they have to promote the, the main event is those two or three shows like damn, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. Other question here. He says at the time of this writing on June 28th, new Japan has signed stardom. Will you guys both watch and review stardom shows? You know, I had that thought earlier today where I was like, you know, I guess technically stardom is like, under the umbrella of new Japan more so than just like a sister promotion and like technically part of new Japan. But you know what this did for me, Jeremy, instead of making me feel like, okay, now this is like ancillary extended universe stuff that needs to be covered. It emboldened me to feel like I don't probably need to cover anything other than new Japan proper. Like this allows me to maybe say, fuck, strong fuck the la dojo fuck tamashi <laughs> tamashi <laughs> none of that shit matters i'm just gonna watch the main product because <laughs> if i'm not gonna watch stardom then i definitely don't need to watch the la dojo academy showcase shows <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh i will not be watching stardom regularly you know uh after we saw it live in new york i was in i was trying to watch and keep up but it, it's it's too much to tr- keep up with. Jeremy got married, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I got to focus on New Japan, and then I watch AEW. I, I don't got time to watch All Stardom. I mean, you know, even James and Rich, like, you know, hit the music is not a normal thing anymore. Yeah, they haven't been hitting that music too often. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like... When, oh, when, when they get excited, that's, you know, when I get a recommendation from Dr. Joshi, I'll watch. Not me. Every time I, every time I see, I hear a recommendation, I turn that shit on and then I'm like, could be better. <laughs> uh, Discord daddy, how many shots will shooter shoot before shooter shots get him shot? Next question. <laughs> Uh, at the time, of the- I just want to say, I just want to say real quick on, on that subject. There was a question. I've, I've been doing a little bit of catch up a few weeks ago. There was a question that was lobbied to uh, Jcast on the whole 
uh, thing that we were alluding to with um, with uh, Gabe. Uh, Gabe Kid, and people were asking if he was going to get in trouble. And on their show, they were like, "Who said that? No, no one said that. Who said that?" And they're like, "Our friends at, at uh, Keeping a Strong Style." I just want to say, it was my speculation that hypothetically he could be in trouble, but at the same time, he might not be at all. And it sounds like he's probably not. So I don't want to make it sound like anyone said that that was the case. That was my personal, you know, kind of just speculation on, on, on the thing. We'll move on. Uh, so he said, uh, at the time of his writing, he said it's Canada day. Other than Kenny Omega, what Canadian had the greatest run in JPW? That is a good question. Um, I mean, Jericho's got to be up there, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm trying to think, like, if there's Uh, another. Ben Law, Pegasus Kid. Yeah, that's one. Um, Brett. Yeah. You know, a lot of people forget Brett, like, had a pretty lengthy run in New Japan at one once upon a time. Um. I feel like there's got to be like some super heavyweight that I'm like not remembering. Like is Bam Bam Canadian? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, that's a great question. Like I'm like wondering myself. Yeah. You looked that up. We'll uh, keep going. Uh, sad goal. Eight, eight, six, zero says the young boy recently mentioned BOSJ was his favorite tournament. What would you say was the all-time best year, best winner, and best match from BOSJ? Bro, I don't know. <laughs> uh, Dan Coffin said Brock. Is Brock? Brock's not Canadian. He has a Canadian citizenship, but he's not Canadian, right? Right. He's from Minnesota. Right? He's born in Minnesota, right? Well, I know that he was in. I remember he got like a. He was in Canada, and he like was illegally hunting without tags, and he got like. I think he does have Canadian citizenship, so maybe technically he is, but I don't think he's actually. I don't think he's actually. <laughs> uh, so you don't you don't have a, a best year winner match for Boss J? No, bro. Like <laughs> it's like thirty plus years. I couldn't do the same thing for the G one either. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like fuck. <laughs> that's too. That's that. Uh, that's probably a question that that deserves a deep dive and i welcome you to dive deep into that question and get back to us with your findings uh, uh the next question of the recently returned young lions going back to wato plus Ocon, who do you feel has progressed the furthest overall um uh, it's tough i don't know suji's the best yeah, uh, out of uh, everybody that, especially since we've been doing the show, well, I guess Hiro- Hiromu came back like right before we started this show, right? Oh, I thought he meant just in the most. Re- I'm still fixated on the Canada thing. I thought he <laughs> just meant in the mo- like most recent um, iteration. Well, yeah, he's just recently returned, but yeah, I don't know how far he's was going back to Wato and Ocon. So yeah, I guess from that from there moving forward, yeah, it'd be Suji. Um, I forgot. I don't know who his question this was, but it says, "Of all the venues in Japan, where would you most prefer to see a New Japan show?" Uh the Dome. I mean, the Dome definitely, but also I feel like Cork and Hall is a must as well for a, a hot New Japan show. I mean, there's quite a few venues, but I mean, if I could only do one, it's going to be the Dome. Yeah, the Dome's the Dome. Uh, Reddit user Mega Menhune, who has the nicest toes on the roster? I don't know. Probably fucking like, uh, what's her face? Stephanie <laughs> <laughs> <Does that even laughs> McCare? <laughs> no, she's not on the roster. She don't count. I don't know, bro. I'm, I'm not a toe guy, bro. I'll just tell you straight up. I'm not into fucking feet or toes at all. Like, I am also not a, a feet guy. So yeah, so. like I, here, here's here's the extent of it where it goes for me. Maybe this is TMI, but like, if it's like if if I if I have like a girlfriend or whatever, and she's like, oh, I did my toes. Do you like them? And they're like, you know, like done well. I'll be, oh yeah, they're they're pretty. The same way that like if they're like, do you like these earrings I'm wearing? 
but I've never like looked at uh, earrings and been like, fuck, bro. <laughs> 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 and I've, I've never looked at a girl's toes and been like, you know, uh, I'm not, I'm not king shaming you guys that do, but I just don't per to me, like toes are in the same atmosphere as like an elbow. It's a non-sexual part of the body that just exists. And, you know, I don't get it, you know? Now here, I, here, here's here's where it would be if the toes are fucked up, then we got a problem, right? <laughs> you know, and I just mean from pure like you got to take care of yourself. Same way with me, like I, you know, sometimes I I I clipped my nails yesterday. You can see it right here. You know, I clipped my nails. And you got to keep the shit clean, but like I'm not into toes. I don't know who on the roster has good toes. Like, not many people wrestle bare feet. <laughs> the, who who. I mean, uh, Matt Riddle did. Fuck him. <laughs> um, but if I'm going to answer, I'm probably going to say a girl and probably like, uh, who's the chick with the, the bunny rabbit? Uh, Peter. Yeah, it's probably Peter. Miho Abe. Miho, Miho Abe. I don't know, bro. <laughs> Walker Stewart. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Def Triangle 720. Uh, skipping ahead, do you think for this new, for this year, New Japan will have. World Tag League be a single eliminator. <laughs> Dan, Dan says better ask Tony Atlas. Now, that's a dude who's in the top. <laughs> what needs to be a single elimination? Uh, World Tag League. He said, Will Why? It? Why would it be? I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, they, they make so much money off of that period of time doing round robin. The single elimination tournament wouldn't that would that would severely limit the amount of dates they could do. So probably not, right? Yeah, I unless they're doing like a huge like thirty two team single. Even that, yeah. So I don't see that happening. Also, asked, do you think New Japan should capitalize on the popularity of anime or pop culture in Japan? I mean, they have in the past. There's quite a few things influenced from from that world. I mean, I. I couldn't speak beyond that, but yeah. Tiger Mass W. Uh, he, I tried to watch that show. It was kind of wild. He mentioned uh, Tanahashi and other wrestlers guest starred in Common Rider and have been involved in anime series before. So yeah, I mean, there's definitely been. That's what I'm. Yeah, there's been crossover. Yeah. Uh, with Wrestle Dynasty in Japan, do you think New Japan will utilize certain guys from AEW at Wrestle Kingdom? Is this the only question we have about Wrestle Dynasty or uh there might be another one, but you can go ahead and give your thoughts right now. I don't know that I'm in love with the idea. Okay, and th this isn't like an anti AEW thing. This is just like basically we don't have a strong enough roster right now to really facilitate two nights of a Wrestle Kingdom, right? Like in order for us to have the most successful Wrestle Kingdom that we possibly can. We kind of need to focus all of our booking, all of our strengths, all of our talent and stars into the one night. So while, yeah, doing a second big event the next following night is from a monetary standpoint going to benefit the company, I feel like there's a good chance it's going to weaken the overall strength of what Wrestle Kingdom could potentially be by taking potential dream matches and putting them on the second night. And it's the, it's not unlike what we've talked about where they take one great show and they stretch it out amongst several nights to make more money. Um, I don't know that I love the idea of doing that show the next night in the dome as well. Yeah, I can see that. I could see it taking away. Cause you know, it's Russell King. It was kind of like that WrestleMania, you know, you bring in, outsiders part-timer like, you know you bring in big stars that have the big money dream matches and that's helped new japan world subs you know you go back to uh, alpha versus omega and then other guys you know kenny versus will uh recently like you, you bring in these big guys to do these big matches on this big stage to make it feel special uh, i know there are people that do argue like why do we need to bring in those outside guys let's just elevate our own guys to be in those big spots and i can see that point as well i don't know I, I think that there's a way to do it to make everything work but 
I don't want it to be like a double gold dash thing where it's like, okay, like there are now there's like this mini tournament and we're going to do this thing where it bleeds into Wrestle Dynasty. Um, so, yeah, hopefully. You know what else I don't want it to be like? What? I don't want it to be like Forbidden Door. I, I think Forbidden Door was cool in the fact that like, was the card great? Yeah, it was a great night of wrestling. Yeah. But the only guys that like got utilized are the people that Tony Khan liked from you know, four years ago when he was into new Japan and he clearly doesn't watch the product anymore and had no intention of like really elevating or utilizing new Japan's upcoming guys. And that's why they're using, you know, Tanahashi and Naito and Ishii and guys from, you know, with all these, you know, uh, and trying to bring back Suzuki, like uh, dudes that are washed up and that are beat up and that have tons of miles on them because they perceive them to only be the stars and very little build and nothing that really like truly aside from just whatever the money gate split was that new Japan gets very little elevation realistically, uh, uh, unless you count like Zach beating OC where truth be told, I think they're gunning to get Zach some, sometime down the line anyways. <laughs> um, I just, don't think that that was necessarily the most beneficial thing from a new Japan perspective. And I, I'm hoping that this isn't the reverse of that necessarily. I think that these events should be closer to what we saw with the first forbidden door, where it was closer to like a dream match scenario where it was really, you know, fun and awesome and really cool. And as good of a show as that was, that's an AW show featuring a few new Japan guys. And it's not, the crossover dream match super show that it was once, you know, once built to be, mm-hmm. and now it's going to fall in new Japan to, to do that while also having their biggest show of the year, the day before. So maybe I'll be wrong in the, in the long and, and short of it, but I don't know, man, it just feels like, do we have enough juice to do a wrestle kingdom and then do a super show dream match the very, very next day in the same building and what are the chances? What are the optics going to look like from a New Japan standpoint? If um, you know, and and this is probably going to, from the AEW fan standpoint, be laughable. What if like Wrestle Dynasty outdraws Wrestle Kingdom? <laughs> and 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 you know what? If it's loaded up with guys like Okada, and I'm not saying it will be, but what if what if Okada and Osprey and Brian Danielson and swerve and people like that are all on it and then and, or kenny let's say they bring back kenny omega let's just say they bring back kenny period they'll probably outdraw wrestle kingdom just based off of that fact alone you know what i mean <laughs> yeah i mean there there's a potential there um <laughs> so, i mean also i think that with it being the tokyo dome i think they're gonna also i think gonna put their best foot forward and so i could see o- okada somehow being involved in the main event Bro, historically, when they do two, regardless of what you name it, when they do two nights of the dome back to back, which day does better? The second day. The second day does better. Period. So, what are the chances that the that Wrestle Dynasty is going to do better just because it's the second day? And it, you know, it it probably will. And then, and then the talking point, and this isn't even coming from like a. Um, a tribalist standpoint, but like, it's just going to optically, it'll just look bad. It'll be like, Oh, they couldn't draw as well without AEW, And then it's going to bolster AEW in, <laughs> in, in new Japan. And then just add to that tribalism aspect of it. And part of me is like, well, why couldn't we just have the awesome super show as part of Russell kingdom on the first day and then just sell the shit out? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, how about that? Why don't we just try to sell out the building? Like w- nobody sold out the building in years. Why don't we just fucking do that shit? True. <laughs> uh, his last question: uh, What should New Japan avoid doing for the G One this year? They should avoid sucking. Avoid bad booking. <laughs> I don't even know. It's it's the wrestling. The wrestling needs to be better. Be better. <laughs> Uh, Jace K 2002 If there is one result you can decide In this G1 what would it be So, For example if you want ELP In the never title picture you pick him to beat Hanare Hmm Uh Suji beats um 
Suji to beat Takeshita. Um, I don't know. He's not, he's not going to. Maybe in semifinals, but I think maybe in a semi, but not in the opener. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to go with too much into G1 predictions because we, we're, we're going to do a big show next week with Chris. Uh, so I'll hold my thoughts on that. Uh, Lee Chang is Bay 2. What do you think of Wrestle Dynasty announced on January 5th? My honest opinion is these Forbidden Door type shows have been played out and don't feel special anymore. Meltzer reported recently the numbers for the Forbidden Door this year are down from the previous year. And if we go by what New Japan does at their all together shows, then most of the matches will be multi-man tag matches that would be hard sell to a non-NJPW audience. He's got a good point there. In the past, that's what it's been. The one show where they bucked that trend was the year where they did the uh, the NOAA uh, New Japan crossover and they did all of LIJ versus Congo. And since then, we really haven't seen anything akin to that. Um, this does kind of feel like the spiritual successor to that NOAA New Japan you know, Wrestle Kingdom show. Um, but yeah, what are the chances that it does end up being just a bunch of, bunch of multi-man matches and kind of a nothing burger, you know? Well, I, I feel like with it being in the Tokyo Dome, that kind of sets a different standard for them. So if they do that in the Tokyo Dome, that's on them. But I feel like with it being on the Dome, that kind of sets the precedence of like, all right, we're actually going to get some big singles matches. We're not going to get a card full of multi-man tags. Yeah. And, and don't get me wrong. I, I like a super show as much as the next guy. I really do. And I'm all for this. I've always said on the show that I think they should do a forbidden door style show in new Japan, in Japan. I just didn't think it was going to be the day after the Tokyo dome. Right. Yeah. You know? And maybe, maybe this is the only way they could do the dome is to do it the next day. And maybe from like a monetary standpoint, it just makes more sense for them to do it that way because getting dates on the dome later in the year might not make as much sense or be as feasible for, you know, to guarantee success. But I just, I don't know, man. I'm just like, they really need to focus on their, their own business. And wrestle kingdom is like the key to doing that. And they're going to be splitting their attention between two shows and having to build both of them up, having to promote both of them. I don't know. Maybe they think there's going to be synergy and they'll just carry the momentum, but I don't see it that way personally. Yeah, I think they're really trying to build this whole, you know, Wrestle Kingdom week to make it like a WrestleMania weekend. You, you come in, you go to all the shows, you go to all the fan fests. And so I think they're really trying to attract uh, Western fans and obviously, of course, domestic fans to make it as a bigger week slash weekend. And so I think if you do attract a lot of people traveling in, um, if you're there, you're going to go to both shows. So uh, from that standpoint, it could be a win. Uh, I had a question here from Angel in the chat. It says, what time of year would you ideally want it? Uh, maybe like May before Super Juniors or maybe post G1, like around October time, something like that. Yeah, I think the fall time would be because, you know, during the fall, you know, the G1 winter is going to just defend a briefcase. And so to add a little bit of excitement to the fall, that could be a good spot for it. Uh, let's see here. Next question from K. Sachi. If you're holding up a very long and angry queue at a grocery, but fumbling around with your items at the till, which NJPW wrestler would you want with you to make it less awkward and prevent any escalation? Ishii. That, that's, that's a nice, initially what I thought about. Big Tom just gonna stare at people and no one's gonna say shit. <laughs> uh, Wukong 901. If you had the book for the G1, who are your six that are advancing? On top of that, who do you think will pin which respective champion? I'm gonna hold off on that. To, uh, yeah, next we're gonna week. talk about all of that next week. So let's discuss G1 next week. Uh, Death Triangle 720. If you had to choose, what would Callum and Bolton's theme songs be like? Um, I don't know. I'm not a theme song guy. Jeremy, what do you think? <laughs> uh, I mean, I think Callum's theme is fine for him for right now. Uh, Bolton, I mean, you know, gives him some hard rock, heavy metal kind of thing. Yeah, he's also asking us another question about young guys going in the finals of G1. We'll kick the G1 stuff to next week. Yep. Uh, let's commission 7252. What young talent in your eyes has New Japan failed to build expectation and confidence in 
In my opinion, opinion, Suji, Gabe Kidd, Umora, Oleg, and Newman have impressed me and showed why they are ready to be up and going players for the company. For the other young stars, Umino has somewhat showed why he's not ready to be the ace of the company just yet. Narita has been downgraded to go away heat. Hikaleo has left the company and possibly gone to WWE to be involved in the bloodline story. Uh, if you want my honest opinion, I think you could apply similar logic to all everyone that you've listed because I don't think that they have optimally used any of their young guys just yet, personally. Yeah, I think uh, Great Ocon is one that I felt like, at least for us, had a higher ceiling and has just kind of really been stuck at the bottom. But yeah, I think all these guys, there's definitely work to be done. Obviously, they're, they're making moves now, but these guys should have been ready. Uh, Doc says, which one of the U30 guys goes the further? I think he's talking about G1. Uh, so we'll push that to next week. Uh, yeah, and I don't know who's under 30, and I don't know who's under 40. I don't know anyone's fucking age. <laughs> uh, see, MJ had another G1 question. Let's see, Dark Soldier. Given all the people Gabe has been beefing with, should New Japan announce a segment called Gabe Kid Addresses His Enemies? He already feuded with Eddie Kingston. It makes even more sense. I'm all for it. Whatever they want to do. <laughs> yeah, I don't see uh, many talking segments, but maybe they can do a backstage thing. Uh, this other question, maybe it's blind optimism, but with Shingo losing the Never title to Hanare and having a spotlight match against Danielson in Forbidden Door, could there, could there be a possible chance of Shingo winning the G1? I mean, he got tapped out by Danielson, though. Ref stoppage. Uh, yeah, it was a ref. St- maybe, well, I don't know. Might have been a ref stoppage. Might have been a verbal. It was hard to say. But uh, he got beat clean. It's not usually endearing to one winning the tournament. Yeah. Look at the people who won on that show. Cough, cough, Zach Sabre Jr. <laughs> um, Zach did lose recently to uh, to um, Hechicero, though. That's in, Me- that's in Mexico. We're not. <laughs> <laughs> it's a different place. Don't matter. That's different. Uh, he also says three years ago, three years of Forbidden Door, and I'm shocked there hasn't been a multi man match for the junior heavyweight title, especially given Desperado seems to be a fan of AEW. So, you think he could do a he'd be a shoe in for the show? What say you, Tony? He wasn't a star when Tony Khan was watching a uh, New Japan. <laughs> oh, you think I'm joking? I am not joking. I think I, I. This is something I firmly believe. I don't think that Tony Khan watches New Japan. And why would he? How is he going to have the time given everything he does? It's very clear who he pushes on his shows. They're not guys that are the, the modern day like stars or, or top guys in New Japan. He pushes the people he knew from 2018 and 2017, 2019. Those are the guys that he pushes. Look who he signed. He signed away the best guys from the 2018, 2019 period. Like, he's not going to push Doki. Doki wasn't a star then. Doki became a starter in the pandemic era. Yeah. Tony Khan wasn't watching New Japan during the, the pandemic era. Are you kidding me? He's running his own company. I don't know. Still still kind of questioning. I feel like the junior title would be would fit their style with so many other guys. They it had. would. Yeah. It would. But, you know, look at the guys who've held it. Yeah. He's not, he's not bringing show over. <laughs> Um, his last question here Ed, Another year where Tom Lawler Or Fred Rosser aren't in the G1 What gives New Japan's just not into them you know Yeah I mean I don't know They're they're making the field tighter And for whatever reason They just don't want to bring those guys back I, I don't have the answer for that I think Tom Lawler is great uh, You know and, and not to speak ill of Fred Rosser But I think Tom Lawler is a head and shoulders Above him in terms of talent but uh, it's like a self fulfilling prophecy. You don't, it's similar to what I just said about AEW. You know, um, AEW doesn't think certain guys are stars, so they don't push them to be stars. You know, Japan doesn't see a guy to be a star, and then they they utilize that as their reason for not bringing over Tom Lawler. They're like, oh, he's not a big star yet. And it's like, you never pushed him, you yeah. brought him over twice. <laughs> yeah, bring him over more. And they're like, he's not worth it, he's not a star. Well, uh, you didn't make him a star, right. Uh, question emailed in here from, from uh, Barry Wall says hi guys with it being less matches in the G1 
Should Ishii go and win the N1 in Noah and beat Masaki Tamiya in the finals? I'm kind of kidding, but even with less prestige, that man needs a world title next to his name before he retires. I think that he needs to link up with Billy Corgan and become the NWA World's Heavyweight Champion. Hey, uh, why not? Let's get, get the 10 pounds of gold on, on Ishii. <laughs> you know, maybe you can get a an MLW run. I don't like the new MLW world title. I like the old MLW world title. Same. Yeah. All right. Well, that's it for the questions. We're all caught up there. Uh, last thing, uh, recommended match of the week. Uh, two weeks ago, we recommended uh, Gabe Kidd versus Kaito Kiyomiya and John Moxley versus Josh Barnett from Bloodsport. I watched the Bloodsport match. I didn't like it that much. Um, I thought I was going to like it a lot more. I liked the match they had in, in Ebor quite a bit. I didn't think that this was that great, to be honest with you. I don't know. I It's got a lot of praise. You know me, I like shoe style, but uh, I don't know. It just felt like Mox really couldn't hang with Barnett when it came to the chain wrestling, and then it really it started good, but it got sloppy, and then the only time it really picked up was at the very tail end when Mox got busted open, and even then, it just was sort of anticlimactic. They did not do a, a good crowd either. That probably did not help whatsoever. They did like seven to 700 to 1,000 in, in Budokan, which was kind of crazy, but um, I really wanted to love this truthfully, uh, but it just didn't have the gravity and the the quality of wrestling that I expect from. And they tried hard. Don't get me wrong. I, I hate shitting on it. I really do. And I know a lot of people like this match a lot, but I I couldn't fucking get into it. And I've I've liked a lot of Moxes and Josh Barnett's Bloodsport matches. This one just did not hit for me. Yeah, bro, I I feel the same way. This is one of those matches where like I feel like if Rich is watching it, he'd be like, "Man, they're just rolling around." <laughs> 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 uh, and I don't know, like I I, I I don't know that they worked hard, but I don't know, I just wasn't. It was so long too. Yeah, I just felt like there was a lot of grappling, and it was just. And like Mox is not a good grappler, bro. I'm sorry. Like, there's things he's good at, and. That in particular is not one of them. I think that in spurts, he's okay, but it kind of reminded me. Remember when he had that uh, empty arena match with um, Hager? With Jake Hager, and everyone's like, oh, this is incredible. Wait till you see it. And like you turned in uh, or tuned into uh, Dynamite, and it, it kind of sucked. Like, yeah. That's what this reminded me of. Like it, it wasn't good. Yeah. Well, it's not, he's he's not a shooter. He's not a shooter, bro. Yeah, all the def jitsu isn't <laughs> isn't that gonna make him a great shooter. And then I started to watch Gabe Kid and Kiyomiya. I fell asleep, so I didn't I didn't watch that shit. So you're gonna have to tell me how good you thought it was. Uh I thought it was awesome. Um, you know, this was a, a very uh hate filled uh rivalry program. Um these guys went out there from the get go going at it. I would say the the one like negative of the match and uh, in front of the show Zach Porter kind of you know knocks Gabe Kid on this of like doing too much stuff on the outside um, and kind of like, the outside brawling and antics and there was like one point where like he uh, did like a brain buster to like one of the commentator guys G Man or whatever I guess there's a history there between them and he was doing a lot of stuff on the outside but like once they were like back in the ring like. Uh, Kiyomiya was busted open Gabe Kid was busting open They're throwing these big hard chop strikes Slaps in the face uh, Spitting at each other uh, Just ultimate disrespect And yeah it was very hard hitting Lots of great counters uh, Kaito Kiyomiya of course continuing His uh, Muto cosplay Doing the big shining wizard spots um, So yeah big win And of course man Wrestle Universe Quality was really good. It felt like a big match, big presentation. Uh, commentary was great. Stu Fulton. Um, I forget the other, the other guy. Uh, Mark Pickering. Yeah, Pickering. Yeah. Overall, it, it was a really great match. I could definitely, I'm like four and a half on it. I know people are a little bit lower because they hate Gabe Kid. I know some people are higher, but I don't know. I thought it was a really great match. Hard hitting, bloody, violent, um, hate filled. It was good stuff. Well, since you say it's four and a half, I will tune in. I'll watch it. I'll get around to it. So, well, we will still consider it. Um, 
before we uh, give any recommendations for next week, I'm just going to go ahead and say I'm picking Zack Sabre Jr. versus Hachisera. Dang it. <laughs> That's what I was going to pick. <laughs> well, if you don't have one, then we can just watch that match. Okay. Let's go with that. I knew you were going to say that, so I wanted to say it first. <laughs> <sighs> All right. Well, um, I don't know why you don't just uh, nominate one of those, one of those New Japan AEW matches that you like so yeah, much. Here we go. Well, all right. The four way from Dynamite this Wednesday. No, you can't. You keep nominating shit that you don't even know if it's going to be good yet because it hasn't <laughs> fucking happened. It's Ishi, Claudio, Pack, and Kyle Fletcher. A bunch of fucking losers. What that sounds like. <laughs> Somebody's got to win. <laughs> Uh, oh man um what was i gonna say oh i saw that i saw that hangman promo holy shit bro (laughs) (laughs) like i i know everyone thinks like and i know like i know the projections have been that uh that danielson is supposed to go to wembley and and everything but like they might want to pull an audible on that shit (laughs) yeah hangman needs to win this hangman's not playing, bro. <laughs> <laughs> bro, I'm, I, what is that this Wednesday? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to tune in for that shit for sure. <laughs> Plus, like, those are some of the greatest matches in the history of that company. So, I mean, how could that not be good, you know? Right. Yeah, it should be uh, really great stuff. But that's going to wrap things up for us here this week. Uh, we keep saying next week, Chris Samsa will be joining us to do our annual big G1 Climax preview show. We'll have stats, previews, prediction. We'll talk more about the contest. You know, go over to sportofprowrestling.com. Uh, I think it should be live by now. So check that out. Get your picks and get your brackets. And a great thing, too, you can go in before the tournament starts. You can edit your brackets. If you do your bracket one day, you wake up the next day before tournament starts, you want to, you know, you can edit it up until the tournament starts. So, again, cr- really do, great do job. Bracket, and if you have a dream in the middle of the night and you see something, you know, then you can uh, adjust accordingly based on whatever your prognostication might be. Yeah, you know, you wake up, you see Gene Blast, you know, just going, you know, 9-0, and Undefeated in the block, <laughs> change change your bracket up. <laughs> I've I've gene blasted many times, so I get it. <laughs> All right, so uh, this is our legacy, Jeremy. This is our legacy. <laughs> we never do it in our life. Uh, if you want to watch our show live or listen without ads, remember you can sign up at patreon.com slash ki oh, Jeremy, one before you finish. Can you figure out how to get us? Um, can you reach out to Manscaped to get us uh, a Manscaped package again, <laughs> so we can? Have, because, bro, <laughs> we 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 had the lawnmower 2.0 or 3.0 or whatever the fuck it was. Yeah, 2.0. Um, thank you. And the 2.0, bro, mine mine crapped out on me, and like I I really rely on that thing, and it's broken, and I need I need a new lawnmower but i'm not gonna buy one i'm a fucking podcaster like <laughs> just hit those people up see if they would like to spot if we would you know if they want to give us some ad revenue or whatever the fuck it is and send us a new packet because i could really use a new lawnmower all right i guess i'll try and reach out see see if we get something going <laughs> don't mention to them that we've ever been with i'm sure they won't remember just be like Hey, just checking out. See if you guys have any ad sponsorship partner. We're a new podcast network. We like <laughs> young up and coming uh, podcast network just kicked There's off. Some strong numbers. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I, I would love to hear a uh, tunnel talk manscape read. <laughs> Maybe they don't have to do it if they don't want to, but I, I could really use another lawnmower, like for real. Okay, well, we'll see what we can do. Uh, you can also, guys, make a donation by visiting socialbooks.com slash donate. Click on the donate button under the Keeping the Strong Style logo. Connect with us on social media, on X. Follow us at KI Strong Style, at Sosuplex, and at Jeremy L. Donovan on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Suplex and the Wrestling Squared Circle Facebook group on Reddit. I'm the Pro Black Guy. Just keeping a strong style on YouTube. We are at Suplex. 
join our Soul Suplex Discord server and to interact with us and other wrestling fans, you can email me, Jeremy, at socialsuplex.com. Check out all the other shows that we have here on the Social Suplex Podcast Network. One Nation Radio, hosted by Rich Lada and James Boyd. All Things Elite, hosted by Floyd Johnson Jr. and Austin Simowitz. Imps, WWE Adventure with the Implications, Matthew Mayer. Wrestling Art with Chris Lings. Tunnel Talk with Allie and Leah. And the Trish and Sarah Wrestling Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a rating and review. And we will catch you next week on Keeping a Strong Style. The Ace of Podcasts. It's your bun. Thank you for listening to Keeping It Strong Style. We'll see you next time. See you next time.